Okay, Mr. Marshall, you have a forum available. The attendees are coming in. Um, my computer says it's 636, so that must mean yours says 635. And No, mine, mine agrees with your yours what? for the moment. All right, okay. so let's go ahead. Go for it. All right. <clears throat> Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of November 2nd, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.37 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, and extended again by the state legislature on July 16th, 2022. This planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Am Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Colden. Bruce, you are muted. Here. Thank you. Tom Long. Here. Andrew McDougall. Present. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Present. Uh, Johanna Newman, we've been told, will be late uh, if she arrives at all. And Karen Winter. Here. Thank you. Thank you, board members. Present. I'm sorry. If technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Excuse me. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. All right, board members. So the first item on our agenda for this evening are approval of minutes, and the time is 640. And the minutes uh, to be approved for tonight are from our October 19th meeting, the last meeting we held. Uh, are there any comments on the min minutes that uh, members want to make? Bruce, I see your hand. Um, yes, I read the meeting. I, I would move to uh, adopt in entirety, except there's a, it's, it's kind of a comment or a question. Uh, on the, in relation to the... Uh, Meadows, uh, um, I'm stated as uh, saying, this is on page nine, that I essentially agreed with uh, Mr. Long and that I noted the blame could be laid upon the town and the developer and the town accepted 
the roads 15 years, if the town had accepted the roads 15 years ago, um, uh, the town would be responsible for the progressive deterioration. And that's all accurate. But I said one thing additionally in there, which I think might be relevant, but uh, you decide. I, I also said that I thought that the, uh, the failure of the town to collect 11 of the 13 surety payments uh, for lot releases was, um, in my view, uh, responsible for the, the lack of leverage that the town has. And I thought that that also was a, a factor in terms of, you know, I, I was looking at, you know, that there is failures, you know, throughout this. And I thought that my attempt to document them should include that one. I, I think I said it, I'm sure I said it, uh, but it wasn't recorded. Um, I think it's, I think I would like it to be recorded that the, that in addition to the, uh, following that notice about the failure, um, blame could be laid upon the town um, for its failure to collect 13, uh, 11 of the, uh, of the 13 surety payments, if you would add that there. Okay, thank you. And you've made a motion with, uh, that includes in inserting that language. <clears throat> yes, motion to approve. Okay. Um, why don't we first determine whether we want to uh, add that language? Um, but uh, before that, does anyone else have any other comments? Andrew? No other comments. I was, I was going to support um, Bruce's motion with the amended language. I, okay. I, I don't recall the exact, what he said exactly, but I'm sure that he, he does in attack. <laughs> Okay, so Bruce, why don't you make a first motion to add that language? Okay, uh, essentially so moved, but uh, okay. Pam, have you got that language? I do, I okay. do. I mean, I'm gonna go back into my notes and, and just you know look to see exactly what you did say, but yeah, I have it. All okay. right, and uh, Andrew, can we, are, are you okay with yep. second? I am. That initial okay, so let's, all right. So do, do, does anybody want to have any other comments on the minutes? I haven't seen or heard any other hands. All right, so let's make that, uh, have that vote. So a motion to add to the uh, minutes that uh, Bruce, in, Bruce stated that the town had also failed to collect 11 of the 13 sureties for the subdivision. All right, uh, Bruce. Uh, so moved. And uh, in favor or opposed? Oh, uh, uh, move to adopt the amended minute, uh, minutes as amended. Yeah. All right. Do you need a second? Uh, I thought, I thought I'm, Andrew. Andrew seconded. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh-oh, Mr. Marshall has frozen. Mr. Long, this may be your moment. I'm next on the list. <laughs> Who would be next? I, I believe I am, and I am an I as well. Janet? I. And Karen. Karen. I. And is that everyone? Well, Doug did not give his vote. It's true. Um, hopefully, there he is. He's back. Doug, everybody voted except for you at the moment. We went through. We, we carried okay. on. Okay. Uh, so I'm in favor of um, adding Bruce's language to the minutes. Okay. Thank you for, I assume, jumping in, Tom. Um, so... All right, so then let's do a, a motion to approve those minutes with the edit. Um, and we'll, we could just let's go through again. Bruce? Aye. And Tom? Aye. And Andrew? Aye. And Janet? Aye. Uh, Karen? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. All right. Mr. Marshall, I need just a little bit of clarification. So we just did two 
motions and two votes is the way I'm seeing it. So I have the um, the the first and the second for the first motion, which I guess it was to just amend the minutes as suggested by Mr. Colpam. And so we took that vote. But now we've just taken a subsequent vote, which I believe is to approve those minutes, but I'm not sure who made the motion and who seconded that. All right. Uh, thank, you. thank you for pointing that out. Um, yeah. So I thought I, I made the motion. Uh, yeah, Bruce, Bruce made one initial motion, um, but we didn't okay. clearly get a second. Um, okay. You know, I think we used Andrew's second on the first vote. Um, okay. So why don't you just say that I seconded it? All right. And I'm sorry for that. It's okay. It's it's okay. I misunderstood to begin with. I thought the initial motion was to approve and amend and, and approve. So it's my misunderstanding. But thank you for the moment. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So the second item on our agenda, the time is 647. And uh, we'll move on. So uh, members of the public at this time, if you wish to make a comment. All right, I see one hand from Elizabeth Beerling. And these, this needs to be about topics that are not on our agenda tonight. So Elizabeth, if you would state your name and your address when, when you begin. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, this is Elizabeth Vierling at 36 Cottage Street. Um, I believe what I'm speaking about is not on the agenda. Um, and I also understand that you are not required to respond to any comments at this time. But um, in any case, I did want to propose two questions and a comment. Um, one was that I saw that the town has received a $75,000 grant for streetscape design. And I wondered how that fit with the RFP for town design standards, and if you could provide an update on the status of that RFP. Um, additionally, uh, could you provide an update on the status of the review of the suitability of the Boltwood garage for adding parking levels, and if other sites other than behind CVS are seriously being evaluated? And those are my two questions, whether or not you have, are able to answer them, I understand. Um, and I, my comment is I can't help but comment that as I watch 11 East Pleasant Street rise, um, realize that it was approved without sufficient space between the building and the street for a tree of sufficient size to provide shade. And as you know, trees are also an important component of climate mitigation, which I thought was a town priority. Um, and I hope that new streetscape design standards um, include that consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, let's see, I have, for a moment I had seen a second hand and it's, it has dropped away. So Elizabeth, uh, okay, yeah, your hand has now come down. All right, I don't see any other hands from the members of the public. So this public comment period will now end. All right, so the time now is 6.50 and we will move on into the third item on the agenda and it is a, it, uh, a joint public hearing. So in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, these public hearings have been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding first a zoning bylaw for article two zoning districts and article three use regulations and article 16 FEMA floodplain overlay district. This is continued from uh, June 1st and September 7th and September 21st all in this year. 
to see if the town will add, vote to add Article 16 FEMA floodplain overlay district to the zoning bylaw and amend Article 2 zoning districts to add FEMA floodplain overlay district and amend related sections of Article 3 use regulations to regulate activities in the 100 year floodplain as shown in the flood insurance rate firm maps issued by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, for the administration of the National Flood Insurance Program. Firm maps indicate areas that have a 1% chance of flooding in a given year. The purpose of the floodplain management regulations is to protect the public health, safety, and general welfare, and to minimize the harmful impacts of flooding upon the community. The second hearing, uh, is for the FEMA floodplain overlay district, also continued from the same dates, June 1st, September 7th, and September 21st, to see if the town will vote to amend the official zoning map to add the FEMA floodplain overlay district for the purpose of regulating activities in, as described in Article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district. Are there any board disclosures? I do not see any hands for disclosure. All right, Chris, uh, I think you are probably the applicant for this, or is it Nate? Well, I have an opening statement that I'd like to offer, and then Nate will take it away with the uh, presentation. All right. So um, hello, I'm Christine Brester, Planning Director, and I'd like to update the Planning Board members about where we are with the flood mapping project. We've been talking to you about flood mapping um, for a long time now, and we actually have been working on this project since 2012. There have been a number of delays in moving forward, but we're finally in a position so that um, the planning board can offer a recommendation. The CRC recently offered a recommendation on this uh, project. On April 25th, the town council referred the zoning portion of this project um, and the associated changes to the official zoning map to the planning board and the CRC for public hearings. And on May 2nd, the town council uh, referred the firm map or flood insurance rate maps and the flood insurance study to the CRC for a recommendation. The planning board is not required to make a recommendation on those two things. The CRC opened a public hearing uh, on the project on May 26th and the planning board opened its public hearing on the project on June 1st. The CRC public hearing that was held in May was continued a couple of times. And then finally, on October 27th, um, the CRC made a recommendation on all four of these items, a positive recommendation to the town council. Um, <clears throat> the reason for the recent delays had been that we had everything in place, but we were waiting to receive the flood maps. Um, and we have finally received the flood maps. And I believe you had, um, a link to those flood maps uh, sent to you with your packet materials. The planning board public hearing was opened in June and continued several times as Doug mentioned. Um, our letter of final determination from FEMA arrived in August, but then it took two months more for the maps and the flood insurance study to arrive. So we finally got them in mid-October. Um, the town of Amherst is a participant in the National Flood Insurance Program, which is administered by FEMA. And this program provides flood insurance for property owners whose properties are subject to flooding. If the municipality in which the property is located participates in the National Flood Insurance Program. I'm not going to repeat the history of the project um, as I have on numerous occasions, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, the maps, that we have currently in place are from 1983 and I think 1981. And they were based on the USGS topography <clears throat> with 10 foot contour intervals. And now, um, and, and those maps were also based on data that was gathered up until the early 70s, 1970s. The new maps are based on town of Amherst GIS topography at one foot contour intervals. And they're based on more recently gathered data. This means that the new maps are much more accurate in terms of where flooding occurs. So the town needs to, uh, the town council needs to adopt the flood insurance rate maps as well as the flood insurance study. And town council also needs to adopt the zoning amendment that Nate will present to you um, and the changes to the official zoning map. 
and the planning board needs to make a recommendation on the two zoning issues. Um, if the town fails to adopt the new flood maps, the town of Amherst will no longer be able to participate in the flood insurance program and people in Amherst will not be able to purchase flood insurance through the flood insurance program. Now Nate Malloy will present the zoning amendments to articles two, three, and an additional article 16 and also present the changes to the um, official zoning map to you and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, Nate, I know you've, you've, we've talked about the zoning several times, so I'm hoping you can uh, focus on what's changed in the zoning from the last time we talked about it and, and then show sure. us the maps. Sure, yeah, I have a half an hour presentation, Doug. I can, uh, <laughs> I'll slowly go through it. No, so <clears throat> yeah, in, in brief, um, you know, we have to have local regulations that uh, regulate development in the floodplain. And so what we're doing is creating, you know, Article 16, its own section, the FEMA floodplain overlay district. And so we've previewed this a few times with you in the CRC. The state has looked at our bylaw and said it's all right. And so, um, you know, there's other parts of the bylaw that um, are affected. And so I'm just going to share my screen and I'll walk. I guess, Pam, you also give me permission to share because I, when I made you when I made you host, I guess I disabled my ability to. Um... Okay, I'm going to make you a co-host. Sure. So, <clears throat> um, so you know, our, it's our zoning that becomes our regulatory tool uh, that will keep us compliant with FEMA in the firm program. And so, if that's visible for everyone, the um, there's three sections of the bylaw that's changing. There's Article Two where we define zoning districts, and so. This hasn't changed since um, May or June. You know, it's the, the definition of the FEMA floodplain overlay district. So it's actually what Doug read as the part of the hearing notice. It's the, you know, area defined by the 1% chance of flooding based on the new, um, new firm map. So <clears throat> that's article two. In article three, there's two sections that mention development and floodways. One is this 3.13. And so what's shown in bold italics is what's changing. We're just saying, see also article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district. And then there's 3.22, the flood prone conservancy district. And so the FPC is actually a base zoning district that is not changing. And so in some cases, you know, the FEMA overlay district is gonna be on top of the FPC. And so we've added this language in bold that, um, the floodplain regulations found in Article 16 shall take precedence over any less restrictive conflicting provisions of this bylaw. And, you know, again, this language has been in place for, um, a, you know, a few months, many months, and it hasn't changed. And the state finds that this, this works. Um, and so really what we then have is Article 16 is the FEMA uh, bylaw. And this bylaw will only apply to those areas that are mapped. And so it doesn't apply outside of anything else in town. It really only applies where there's the regulated flood uh, hazard area. And so what we have here is the marked up version, Doug, to show what's changed since you've last seen it. Uh, you know, there's a little spelling mistake up here. Uh, the really important piece is um, when Chris said we received our letter of final determination, the maps and flood studies are dated February 9th, 2023. And so what that means is we have to have our local vote uh, on these regulations um, four to six weeks ahead of that. Uh, and then we send it to the state and FEMA for their final review and approval. And they have to approve it by February 9th. And so um, that becomes the effective date of our new maps and flood insurance study. Uh, if we are delayed doing that, then, um, well, I'm not sure what'll happen, but let's hope we don't get there. Um, you know, there are some language changes, just minor um, in the purposes, you know, prevent the occurrence of public emergencies. Uh, there's this, uh, there's an addition, allow the floodplain to operate naturally and drain floodwaters without development that can add to flooding. So, you know, nothing, um, you know, so like I said, these are just the changes uh, in the last, you know, four to six weeks. Uh, in the definition section, we used to parenthetically, um, reference every every code after each defined term and we found that to be somewhat uh 
kind of difficult and it was confusing. So we actually say the definitions are based on state building code, standard references found in the state building code and FEMA regulations found in the code of federal regulations. And so where you see where we define development, we've, you know, we've removed this, this parenthetical afterwards. And it, you know, it's not really necessary. The state, um, the state coordinator said, we don't really have to do that, um, have this parenthetical and that this statement was fine. And so really that's what's changed within uh, the bylaw. We actually don't have this type of flood hazard boundary map. So that could be removed from the definitions. We don't have that. And uh, that's not what we're adopting in Amherst. We clarified that, um, that in the floodway, it's the elevation shown on the approved firm maps as opposed to the designated height. Um, just to clarify that that's what, you know, how the floodway is defined. And again, these definitions are only applicable within the FEMA floodplain overlay. So, you know, it's not, uh, it doesn't apply anywhere else. So um, where we see new construction, again, that's only for the, the FEMA area. Um, none of this has changed. It's all been the same. Uh, start of construction, we say we, and we added that the actual start of construction must commence within 180 days. And it said it where the statement is crossed out, but um, we felt it was cleaner language this way. It didn't change the meaning at all. And so these defined terms, um, you know, we added an A and a B here. It was in, uh, um, we separated it out again, just to clarify it, the floodplain administrator. So, uh, the state recommends having a position that can help administer the bylaw. And here we're naming the planning director uh, in, in the absence of the planning director, their designee. And, um, you know, some communities have a different position really, uh, you know, we think the planning director is in a good position because it coordinates with many departments, conservation, public works, and really the floodplain administrator is helping to make sure that everything's coordinated. They don't necessarily have to enforce, um, you know, certain regulations, they just have to make sure that the applicant or the town is following them. And so here we had said that their duties may include. And so, you know, the state said, we don't even have to list these, these specific duties of the floodplain administrator. We're doing that in part just to help educate, uh, you know, an applicant, the town and boards and committees. And so we've restructured this a little bit, um, you know, coordination with local departments, we removed oversight of the application review process because that's something that will happen. You know, we're saying up here, ensuring permits are applied for. And so again, it was somewhat redundant. Um, you know, we say working with the appropriate local staff to coordinate compliance issues and enforcement actions, uh, maintaining current historic, current and historic FEMA maps. Uh, and then, so these sections were re-lettered, re renumbered. Uh, we also removed the addresses from the FEMA one uh, risk analysis and the, the Massachusetts state coordinator, just in case they change, the bylaw doesn't have to change. And so that was acceptable to the state just to mention that we have to provide notice to them. The real, you know, the regulatory piece of this is, you know, 16.3, the regulations. And so this follows um, the standard FEMA bylaw. The one difference is 16.31 local permitting. So FEMA wants to know that we, that the town of Amherst will um, monitor any development in the floodplain. And so this first paragraph right here, it says we, the town of Amherst requires a permit for all proposed construction or other development in the FEMA floodplain overlay district. And the rest of that is really standard FEMA language, you know, new construction, changes to existing buildings, placement of manufactured homes, you know, agricultural facilities fill. Um, what, what we're proposing is kind of our local language is um, what's shown here. It says the town's permit review process includes the requirement that the proponent obtain all local, state, and federal permits. Um, it says, in addition to any building permit or other local, state, federal permits needed, any development in the FEMA floodplain overlay district um, down here shall require a review by the wellands administrator to determine if review and approval by the Conservation Commission is required. Um, and so, that's actually happening right now with our new permitting software. Anytime a permit is located within a floodplain area, uh, it's all electronic. The wetlands administrator is notified and they have to review it. So even an electrical permit gets flagged and they review it. And so 
by adding this language here and you know we have a new permit we're starting with some new permit software the wetlands administrator really will review uh, all permits and then if they determine it needs some type of permitting process um, you know most of it will require review and approval by the conservation commission then we follow the fema uh, guidelines and if no review is required then the wetlands administrator can note that in the permitting software and again that's compliant with fema uh, so that's the local piece the rest of all this section 16.3 like i said is kind of standard language from fema uh, encroachment to floodways unnumbered flood zones and as you can see none of this has really changed um, Subdivision approvals, we just included by town staff just to clarify who's looking at this. So, you know, if there's a subdivision, we just have to make sure that, um, you know, that we're following what's also in this section of the bylaw. Uh, and base flood elevation, uh, we said greater than 50 lots and or five acres, as opposed to whichever is less, which we thought was somewhat confusing. Um, you know, we changed a little bit of the language here again. And again, we we eliminate the addresses for the co state coordinator or the firm pr uh, program specialist, just so that if the address changes, we don't have to change the bylaw. Um, we're saying that the flood plan administrator shell is required to um, request from the state building code if there's an appeal or a variance request. And so, you know, that's something that we would do anyways, instead of saying will, it's shell. And uh, really, uh, I guess the big change is we name the building commissioner as the enforcement officer, and um, you know the building for the building commissioner is the zoning enforcement officer, and so this is a piece of zoning. So it really shouldn't be the floodplain administrator; they're really the coordinator, and the building commissioner uh, is named elsewhere in the bylaw as the zoning uh, enforcement officer. So we don't actually need this enforcement section; uh, it's kind of repetitive to other sections in the bylaw, but it's nice to have it all in one, you know, FEMA overlay district section. So. You know, those are, you know, I just went over Article 2, 3, and now the proposed 16. Um, what, you know, what it looks like is, um, you know, here's one map panel. And so this is, uh, here's Amherst College, here's the center of town. Sorry about that. The new map panels, oh, it's really touchy, um, are based on, Overlay districts, uh, I mean, you know, are overlaying over the um, aerial photographs. And they're a lot more accurate. So the current maps, you know, like Chris said, are from 1983. They don't have any structures. They don't have any aerial imagery and they're hard to read. This one, and it's, uh, there we are, is showing the actual floodway and the cross hatching and then the regulated area in blue. And so it's really detailed. Right, it, it really follows the elevation, the contours. There's cross sections here with specific elevations. And um, so this is a lot more accurate than it used to be. And so when, when Chris mentioned that this has taken a while, these maps were essentially generated in 2020 with re new regression analysis that was uh, developed in the late 2000s. And so the maps themselves really haven't changed. The, you know, the, all the studies and everything were done. What happened was on some of the map panels, some of the mapping itself needed to be updated with the new regression equation. So it's not as if the boundaries were, were wrong. We, the maps just hadn't been updated to show the new, some of the new areas. Uh, and I guess FEMA is really strict about labeling of cross hat of uh, cross elevations and sectional elevations. And so some of the labeling was incorrect. And so FEMA just required that these map panels be adjusted. Now, all these map panels, and this thing is really, um, really touchy is um, we'll have a, uh, an effective date of, it should have it of February 3rd, February 9th, 2023, um, if that's visible. I'm trying to zoom out a little bit. Um, yeah, so map revised February 9th, 2023. And so if when they adopted this will have, you know, that's the date. There's a webpage on the town's planning department that has a comparison map. And I think this is more useful, a more useful tool to show townwide what it looks like. And so it shows the yellow is the 1983 map and the blue or blue is the, uh, the updated map. And so if we zoom in, you, know, you can see in this area of town, uh, the yellow is the old map. And so the boundary is 
uh, not as accurate in terms of topography and the newer map is. And so this is a, a slider map. So you could, you know, you can zoom in, but you can see you could turn it on and off the whole town. So here's what it would look like today uh, with the current 83 maps. And here's what it would look like with the proposed maps. And so the overlay district only applies what's shown in blue here. And so those definitions, the regulations only apply in this area. And so, you know, in this section, you can see where it's a lot more accurate in terms of following topography. Uh, it follows the stream corridor a little bit more accurately. So in some cases on the 83 map, the stream or river is actually almost outside the actual floodway, the flood map area. And so, um, you know, this is really what, what, what it captures. And so, um, you know, I could zoom out and show you the whole town again, but that this is really what it will look like, you know, when these, when this, if this is adopted, this is where it applies just in this area. Okay. Thank you, Nate. <clears throat> so board members, uh, any questions? Uh, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. I actually don't have a question. Um, Nate, I was just going to say that the link for the map, the slider map in, in our attachment wasn't working for me. Okay. I, I, you've, you showed it before, so that's it's fine. I've you know seen it, but uh, if anybody else was trying it, they may not be able to connect either. Okay. Uh, Bruce. Just wanted to say what a great job it appears that everybody's done, uh, all before I arrived here, of course, but uh, it, I think it needs to be said that it's clearly been a, a, a pretty uh, prolonged uh, act of heavy lifting or, or just sustained lifting. So uh, thank you all. So very impressive. All right. Thank you, Bruce. I would second your comments. Um, anybody else have any comments? I don't see any other hands. I'm not seeing any. I will but uh, ask the public uh, attendees, do any of you want to make comments on these flood maps and the zoning proposed changes to incorporate them in this district? Not seeing any public hands raised. Um, well, maybe we can move right to a vote. Uh, does uh, Tom? I would move to a, a, a would it be approve this? I believe we're recommending to we're town recommending? council. I would move to recommend this. Um, very uh, complete and well presented document from Nate. All right, uh, Karen. If I read your I list, second that. yes, okay. <laughs> I second this. Yes. Okay, thank you, Karen, and thank you, Tom. Let's see. Are there any other comments before we go ahead and vote? So the motion is to recommend to town council that they adopt the zoning changes uh, the, uh, and. Uh, incorporate the maps and create the overlay district. Is that close enough, Nate? Sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good. I mean, it could also, the motion could also include to close the hearing. Yep. So moved. All right. All right, so then, uh, Karen, I see your hand. Okay, it's a legacy. I, I will second. All right, thank you, Janet. Karen had already seconded. Yeah. Okay, uh, Bruce, can you? How will? You, how do you vote? Aye. All right. Thank you, Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Aye. Karen. Aye. And I'm an I as well. So six in favor and one member absent. Congratulations, Nate and Chris and Pam, however much you contributed. And uh, this has been a long, long uh, slog, I guess. Hopefully it'll be another 50 years before we have to do this again. 
Okay, so moving along to the next item in our agenda. All right, the time now is 7.16. And we have another, we have a zoning bylaw hearing, item four on the agenda. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, these public hearings have been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding a zoning bylaw proposal for food and drink establishments. Uh -oh, we lost you, Mr. Marshall. All right, I'm back. Can you all hear me? Yes. All right, I seem to have a bad internet connection tonight. All right, so uh, uh, I, I don't know exactly when I froze, so I'll uh, say the time now is 718 and we are doing a zoning bylaw for food and drink establishments, Article 3, use regulations, Article 5, accessory uses, Article 11, administration and enforcement, and Article 12, de definitions to see if the town will vote to amend Article 3, use regulations to delete existing use categories in section 3.352.0, class one, restaurant, cafe, lunchroom, cafeteria, or similar place, section 3.352.1, class two, restaurant or bar, and section 3.352.0, restaurant, cafe, bar with food, or other similar food and beverage establishment where food is available at all times. Section 3.352.1, bar with no food served. Section 3.352.2, nightclub and section 3.352.3, .3, any of the above, food and drink establishments with occupant capacity of more than 250 occupants and to add standards and conditions for these uses and to amend Article 5 accessory uses, sections 5.041, 042, and 043 to allow seasonal outdoor dining as an accessory use to a principal use authorized by section 3.3 to allow outdoor furnishings associated with such use to remain in place between November 1 and April 1, as long as the use is active and operational, to remove the pro prohibitions on outdoor heating and cooling devices, and to allow live or pre recorded entertainment as an accessory use to a principal use authorized by Section 3.3, and to delete reference to drive in restaurants, and to amend Article 1, uh, 11, rather administration and enforcement to rearrange the paragraphs describing when site plan review is not required and to clarify the requirements and process for granting administrative approval and to amend article 12 definitions by clarifying section 12.05 bar and by deleting section 12.11 drive up restaurant and any associated renumbering that may be necessary. That's probably the longest sentence I've ever read. Do we have any board member disclosure for this hearing? All right, I do not see any. Um, Chris or Nate, uh, which of you would like to make the presentation? I don't have an introduction, so Nate is going to make the presentation, and I wanted to point out that Rob Mora is here, um, and he can answer questions. Thank you. 
Sure. Thanks, everyone. Nate Malloy, a planner with the town, and I'll be presenting this food and drink establishment zoning amendment. I think Doug, Doug covered it all <laughs> in that one long statement. I'll, uh, I'll go into a little more detail, though. I'm going to share my screen. I have a presentation, and then we can walk through the, the you know, the language of the bylaw. And so, the, you know, this the, the planning board um, has seen this before, and there's been some slight changes um, in response to comments from the planning board and CRC. And so, you know, what may have started as, you know, um, Article 14, we're really calling it updating food and drink establishments because that's what we're doing. The, that one classification, the use classification in the uh, in the zoning bylaw. And so, you know, the background is that planning staff had been looking at um, changes to 3.352 um, prior to COVID, and then when you know when when the pandemic hit and we were using Article 14, we realized that. Um, you know, we could, we could do this. Um, you know, we have the capacity, uh, we've been applying standards and conditions for the past 20 years, uh, that really seemed to work. And so, you know, what Janet found was the town meeting action from 2001. And so that had updated, uh, the bylaw at that time. And my thought is that this is, you know, an update based on 20 more years of experience. And so, um, you know, we're trying to make it better and better. Uh, additionally, the community resources committee town staff and the business community liked certain aspects of Article 14 temporary zoning and wanted to see if those could be uh, incorporated into the bylaw. And so some of that is administrative approval. Uh, some of that is the accessory uses in Article 5. And so, you know, uh, because of that, this, this zoning amendment actually touches a number of different articles in the bylaw. Uh, the purpose is really to have new classifications of food and drink establishments that correspond to the uses that we're seeing. Um, you know, right now we don't really have a definition for a bar or a nightclub, although those are what you know we're seeing uh, being requested and proposed. Uh, we'd like to clarify and improve the permitting process for businesses in the downtown and village centers, um, and you know, apply the lessons of Article 14. And so, typically, right now, you know, there are uses that um, could go through site plan review, but because there's no changes. Uh, to the exterior of a building, they get administratively approved. And that's happening right now. And it was happening before Article 14 is happening with Article 14 right now. Um, and so the planning board actually doesn't see many applications for restaurants or food and drink establishments. And, you know, so I think we, we think that's a great way to encourage businesses to stay and expand in Amherst. And so we're trying to formalize the administrative review process in Article 11. Uh, and, you know, this supports efforts of the bid and chamber. And you know, this is just an example of what was permitted through Article 14. Uh, the Drake, the spoke expanded to include this whole building. It almost uh, essentially doubled in size. Uh, Mexicolito opened and Garcia's opened. And so during Article 14, uh, the town developed an application process. And so although it was administrative approval, an applicant had to submit a management plan, uh, floor plan, site plan, and there was a written decision that was filed with the town. And so um, that's something that Article 14 authorized, and it's really not in the bylaw now. And that's what we're suggesting in Article 11 to move forward, is that even an administrative approval has um, some, a, a record of the decision. Just to highlight that there's five zoning districts where this applies. It's in the uh, business village center and limited business, uh, neighborhood business, uh, general business, and commercial. And so. It's these areas that are highlighted in red and pink and cross hatching. So the regulations in terms of where food and drink establishments are permitted uh, only happens in these areas. Everywhere else, uh, they're not allowed. Just a comparison of what we're of what's existing and what's proposed. So right now we have class one, class two, and class three um, you know, definitions in the use table. So class one is a restaurant, cafe, lunchroom, cafeteria, or similar place that closes before 1130. It's site plan review, but mostly it's administrative approval. Uh, there's class two, which is a restaurant or bar. It's open after 1130 uh, and it's a special permit. And then there's a drive up restaurant that's also a special permit. Um, proposed is you know new definitions in the use uh, table. So restaurant, cafe, bar with food, or other similar food or beverage establishment. And so it's site plan review administrative approval. There's bar with no food. And so 
when we had this discussion before, Doug, you asked, like, what does it mean by no food? But really that means they don't have a kitchen. So um, that's a special permit. Uh, you know, if there's a, a bar that has a full kitchen, then it's in the first category here, bar with food. And so that's something that staff uh, and the building commission understand. A nightclub, which there are a few in Amherst and there's been some discussion about there could be more, that's a special permit. An establishment with more, um, with occupancy of more than 250. And so that's not seating, that's, you know, an occupant load uh, by code. And so um, again, that special permit. So what we're proposing is that, you know, uses that may have more impacts are still by special permit and ones that we've seen can be, um, can, you know, can be managed through conditions uh, that we have been applying um, can be through site plan review. And so for the last 20 years, class two restaurants are pretty much always approved with a standard set of conditions. And so we can apply that now in the site plan review um, and not have them go through a special permit process. In terms of what, what it would look like um, existing restaurants and how they'd fit into the proposed permitting pathways, um, you know, Johnny's Tavern, El Comolito, uh, Pita Pockets and House of Teriyaki. And we have the ma uh, maximum occupant capacity shown. And so there was a question about why was 250 chosen as a threshold. And so Johnny's for instance is about 175 right now. And that has been managed um, really well for its size through the permitting it has. Um, if it jumps to 250, then it may become more impactful. And so 250 really was, you know, to allow some existing to expand and it's a, around that size is where um, the size and possible impacts could be greater. So that's, you know, why we chose 250. Um, a bar with no food is like the Moan and Dove. So prepackaged food or certain things like peanuts or, you know, a bag of pretzels is not considered food in this instance. And so that'd be a special permit. Um, Hazel's Blue Lagoon is a nightclub. Uh, and then the hangar in ABC, you know, has a capacity of almost 400. So that'd be a special permit. Uh, and, you know, with the changes to food and drink establishments, um, as Doug read, there's changes to accessory uses in Article 5. We're trying to formalize administrative approval in Article 11, and then slight modifications to definitions in Article 12. And so, although we're trying to update the food and drink establishments and just in, you know, table three, it has this ripple effect for these other areas. Um, I was just going to quickly walk through those. And so existing table three, um, you know, basically everything's being removed except for this one condition that in the neighborhood business district, a class one restaurant shall have um, no more than 30 seats indoor and out, both indoor and outdoor, and it shall um, stop serving alcohol at nine. And that there's this perimeter of um, you know, this buffer at an outside wall of a building occupied by the establishment should be located more than 100 feet from any residential dwelling in a residential district. And so <clears throat> everything else in, in this section would be replaced with a proposal um, to have these new uses, a restaurant, cafe, bar with food or other similar food beverage establishment, a bar with no food. And what's shown in blue here is what's changed since the last time um, you've seen it and what was, you know, the CRC also asked for some changes. So a nightclub, parenthetically as defined by the state building code. Right. And then, you know, any food or drink establishment with an occupant, occupant capacity of more than 250. And so a nightclub, the state building code says that it's, um, you know, has let few, you know, less seating than, um, than uh, capacity, like loud music, dim lighting. Um, so there is a definition in the state building code that would be applied if someone was um, asking for it. And so, um, and then as applicable, we have all these standards and conditions <clears throat> that can lead to conditions in an administrative approval or site plan review. And so, you know, if applicable, they're subject to the Board of Licensing Commissioners, other state uh, and local codes, uh, accessory uses, we're, you know, specifically calling out outdoor dining, live or pre-recorded pre live or pre-recorded entertainment, uh, and a drive-through facility. Um, we're asking that they operate and be maintained in accordance with an approved site plan, floor plan, a layout plan with occupant capacity for indoor and outdoor dining, a patron management plan, <clears throat> a general management plan, a parking management plan, and a traffic impact statement. 
And so even if an applicant were applying for site plan review and it was determined to be administratively um, approved because there are no changes, we would still ask for all of these things, which could lead to conditions in an administrative approval. We're asking that the management plan include hours of operations, you know, trash, trash and refuse storage, outdoor dining if applicable, queuing, signage, lighting, delivery, noise containment, um, and response to complaints. And what's new here is strategies to screen buffer adjacent properties from noise and other impacts, uh, employee parking and other requested information. Um, so, you know, in the management plan now, there's gonna be a section where if, you know, we're asking applicants to describe how they can protect adjacent properties. And so, you know, if they say they're going to manage, um, you know, how they close in terms of directing people down a certain street or something, then that can become a condition that can be part of the permitting. And so, you know, the language isn't too exact, but what it's doing is it's helping direct um, staff and the applicant to what could be conditions. Um, you know, electronic ID verification if they are serving alcohol, on site staff training and certifications, including crowd control and tips. Uh, number eight, reusable tableware shall be used for outdoor table service. Um, you know, all, um, all areas to be cleaned in daily and left in a clean condition by the end of normal business hours. Uh, outdoor furniture shall be placed to meet clearance services and egress requirements. And then this BN condition uh, that remains from the current. And so, you know, what we're proposing is everything here in bold italics in table three. I'll just walk through article 11 quickly. The, um, as I mentioned, a number of site plan review, whether it's food and drink or other site plan review uses, if there are minimal changes to the exterior, uh, then they actually are administratively approved now. And we're proposing to strengthen that administrative process so it's shown here in bold italics is being proposed and what's um, in red strike through is proposed to be removed. Um, so, you know, we're just clarifying that, uh, you know, site plan review shall not be required when, and these were already in the bylaw and we're just renumbering them and nesting them under this site plan review is not required when, just so it's clear when there's no physical change to the exterior of a building or site. The only change to the exterior of a building or site includes the installation of signs in compliance with Article 8. And a change of use is proposed and no physical changes to the exterior or site will occur. And the building commissioner determines that the changes won't conflict with the purpose of this bylaw and finds that the proposed use will not result in further need for review under, sec under the following section. And minor alteration for building um, to building exterior or site. So as you can see, you know, there's minor changes to these sections, but essentially this language was, is already in the bylaw. Um, and so if any of this occurs, there really isn't site plan review. It's administratively approved. What we're adding is this new section, administrative approval in instances where site plan review is not required. Um, we're saying no work shall commence until the building commissioner has authorized the work to, or use to proceed. Uh, the building commissioner may approve, approve with conditions, or deny the proposal. Decisions shall be made in writing, filed with the town clerk, and kept on record with the conservation and development department. The building commissioner, in consultation with the plan director, shall be authorized to apply any design review criteria found in Article 3, Section 3.204, Design Review Principles and Standards. And so this isn't taking away review by Design Review Board, but it's saying that staff, the building commissioner, could apply those in an administrative review instance. Uh, and then, you know, 11.213, um, I guess it's just renumbered, but it's already in the bylaw that they may seek guidance, the building commissioner may seek guidance from the design review board or historical commission. And so really the, the big change to article 11 is this paragraph, strengthening administrative approval and reorganizing when site plan review is not required. So we're renumbering and putting all this together. In article 12, as Doug mentioned, we're changing the definition of a bar slightly where we say food may be incidental to the consumption and service of alcohol. And so we have a definition of bar. Um, and then we're deleting a drive up restaurant. Essentially, we, we would now consider a restaurant, um, a drive up restaurant, a restaurant, and then the drive through facility is considered an accessory use. And so, um, 
you know, we're deleting this because this would just become um, a restaurant, which is a defined term further in the bylaw. And I, I think I could stop, I guess there is section five, um, which maybe I skipped accessory uses. Um, we're proposing to say that anything, um, so it's only you know 5.04 retail uh, business and consumer services. We're saying that seasonal outdoor dining, including sidewalk cafes, courtyard or terrace dining and similar uses may be permitted in the BG, BL, BVC, BN or COM. So this is already here. Um, as long as an accessory to a principal use authorized by section 3.3 and subject to the same review as, as the principal use. And so before it listed, you know, one, two or three, um, we're proposing to eliminate that. And so there was some question about, so any use in section 3.3, which is the use chart, and we're saying yes, but it has to be accessory. So, you know, is someone really going to go through the effort of spending, um, you know, six figures to put in a kitchen to have an accessory use to, um, you know, um, say like, you know, a, a gas station, maybe, maybe a gas station would say I could come up with some accessory dining options, but really it has to be accessory um, to that. We're allowing outdoor dining, um, saying any structure or framework uh, for the dining shall, shall remain as long as the accessory use is active and operational. And that, you know, before we'd say that it couldn't operate between November and April, but we're saying, you know, if someone wants to maintain outdoor dining year round, then, then let's have them try that. And so the changes to this, this section are allowing that. Also in 5.0413, it had said no such facility shall be equipped with freestanding heating and cooling devices or served by an HVAC system of adjacent buildings. And we're striking that uh, we found during the pandemic that we actually did install um, freestanding heaters and they worked really well. For live or pre-recorded music, we're kind of following a similar instance to outdoor dining, that they are accessory to any principal use allowed in section 3.3 or a bed and breakfast. Um, you know, so if it's a special permit use or a site plan, then it will be allowed by that as opposed to just specifically to a restaurant bar in or bed and breakfast. Um, and I think those are the changes to the accessory uses. Um, we removed this one section in drive through facilities because it's no longer proposed in the use chart. So, you know, drive through facility would still be allowed as an accessory use if someone wanted to do that. And so those are the changes to the accessory uses. So, you know, much of this is already in the bylaw. We're not, we're not changing a lot. We're trying to expand uh, outdoor dining to go year round and that it could be permitted as accessory to a few different things, not just restaurants or bars. All right, <clears throat> thanks, Nate. All right, I see a couple of hands from board members. Uh, thanks for your patience. Janet. Nate, I wonder if you can go back to your PowerPoint um, on the the one that has like the current. The little chart. Yeah, the, the, the little, the, the original PowerPoint, and it has, um, let's see, go back. I, I think it was your second or third slide. And so, you know, when I was looking at the um, planning board report to town meeting, you know, in the old days, any bar or restaurant had to have a special permit, and then they broke out into these different categories. And so looking at the existing class one restaurant, um, there's a there's also a distance from residents, you know, residents in R and an R zone, a residential zone, and so you can go from class one, you know, a class two restaurant, a restaurant and bar that's open after eleven thirty, could be class one if it's more than one hundred and feet, one hundred fifty feet away from a home, um, and so I think that in a way the existing category you're not including all the factors. So proximity to private homes or you know residences or apartments in a residential zone can put you either in class one and class two. Um, so I think that's sort of you know so 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 I think that this chart doesn't kind of explain what you know all the reasons you go into class one and class two. Um, and I, you know I saw so you know when I was reading you know my question has been um, why do we why did 
the planning department, the planning board, the zoning subcommittee, the select board, town meeting vote in these, these categories. And so I thought that the planning board report was really useful. And they recognized the planning, you know, the recommendation from the board was they recognized that impacts on residents would be based on different factors, proximity to, you know, apartments or homes. Um, how late is it open? And are you drink are people drinking? You know, and you know, with the idea that last call, you know, is kind of an exciting time in lab time. And I don't know what has changed that would make us go from special permit for every bar and restaurant to, to you know, loosening up some criteria that we have now, site plan review, mostly administrative approval for a restaurant or a cafe um, that closes before 1130 or stays open after 1130, but it's not close to homes, you know, where people sleep. So, you know, I-, I so, just, you, so your question is what's changed, right? Yeah, and I, you know, it seems well, let's, like- Let's see what Nate and Rob have to say about that. Well, I guess what has changed in terms of impacts on, you know, residents and what, you know- Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I think the, um, I think what's changed is, you know, we've had 20 years of experience and now in the proposed use chart, we've developed a standard set of conditions that would be in place. So, you know, one through 10, which weren't in place prior to 2001 when this was adopted. And so, you know, we're asking for a number of things that weren't asked for before, you know, from site plan to floor plan to a management plan that has noise, um, noise containment in response to complaints to buffering. So, you know, we have 20 years of experience. And <clears throat> what we found was, um, you know, what we had mentioned this last time, many places will come in, get a class one permit, and then immediately transition to a class two. And once they're already established, they almost always get uh, approved as a class two. And so what we found was that the, the distance to the residential districts and the time of operation, you know, could be managed with these, with these conditions right here we're proposing. And so it wasn't, um, you know, they're not as relevant as they were prior to 2000 because, you um, Perhaps the bylaw didn't have as much teeth in it in terms of conditions that were being written into a restaurant. Uh, we've also, one thing just to clarify is that a bar with no food and a bar with food could be the same establishment, but they may be two different uses. And so they may actually have to have two different permits. <clears throat> and so the monkey bar is an example where for most of the time they operate as a bar with food and they'd be site plan review. But after hours, say at nine o'clock, they're gonna close their kitchen and they're going to become a bar with no food, you know, four nights a week, then they actually still have to get a special permit because now they're a bar with no food. And so if a restaurant, what we found is that if a restaurant wants to serve food and stay open late, uh, you know, they don't need to have a special permit. They can be site plan review. If they want to transition to a bar with no food, that's actually a different use category and they would need both a site plan review and a special permit. And so we don't actually don't think we're, we're, um, you know, we're reducing the, the, you know, the protections to neighborhoods. We're actually incorporating it in these standards and conditions we're proposing in the bylaw. Look, and so, I'm, not, okay. I'm, not, I'm not quarreling with that, but is there, so there'd be no notice to abutters? There'd be no public hearing? There'd be no opportunity for residents or anybody to participate in almost, you know, all things that fall in that category of bar, restaurant, food, you know, after 11.30, close to residents. So that that's what the huge change is, is, a, is the taking the lack of a notice to abutters, a public hearing, a chance for the public to participate and to know when the permit issues and how to appeal it if they, if they choose to. So I think that is a big change. I don't quarrel with, I think these standards and conditions are great. I think there's a lot of really good things in these changes, but I do think this is a huge change to take it out of the public, you know, the public eye. Um, abutters have no notice. And then also no resident has any ability to participate in an open hearing like we have here. And so, you know, so I guess what my question is, what has changed? Well, the impacts really haven't changed. Um, the public's interest in these type of establishments when they're close to them, when they're open late and they're allowed. And, you know, if we bootstrap in, the live music and outdoor dining, 
a lot of these things can happen with actually no notice to the public abutters or participation. Because if it's under site plan review, the building commissioner is doing most of those. And, you know, things just will happen in people's neighborhoods without noticing it. So, I, you know, so I just don't, that's my fundamental issue. Okay. But I kind of, but I kind of just wonder, like, the current process seems to be working fine. You know, people have a chance to know what's going on, participate. People, you know, restaurants and bars are getting permits. Probably the permits are adjusted by comments. So I, I'm not quite sure why there's such a seismic change in this part of the these bylaws. Other parts I think are really good. Well, I mean, I, I like to think of it as like, you know, the 2001 was an update on something that was 30 years old and now we're updating it 20 years later because we found there's ways to improve it. And so, you know, currently anything that's site plan review, if there's no changes, doesn't get noticed and it goes to, through administrative approval. So if there is something that changes to the exterior or needs to, you know, outdoor dining is added to an establishment, that's a site plan review hearing and abutters are noticed. But, if but it's permitted as site plan review and the outdoor dining stays and then the restaurant changes hands, there's already a land use permit on there with conditions. And so, right, the abutters won't be noticed. That doesn't change. That that's what happens now. That's what would happen in the future in their proposed changes. So, um, but you've taken you know. special permit and reduced it quite greatly. You've taken that away from the ZBA quite a bit. Well, so what we found is that the ZBA approves almost all the permits. So there's really no discretion being used, right? And so if they're not denying them and they're per, and they're standardizing their conditions, right? We've just taken that and applied it in the use chart, and now it can be site plan review because we found out what conditions can work. And but so, I, I think we all agree on the conditions, the need for that, but now does the ZBA have, do people come and talk? Do you, they have notice to abutters, they have residents will know, you know, there's gonna be a change in hours or, do you know, so I don't see what the problem is other than, I mean, I, I love the standards oh. and conditions. I think that makes sense, but I don't love the idea that we have re we're reducing public participation about our notice and, and the board's participation. Okay, I think uh, that's I'll clear. Start. That's clear. And uh, I think it'll be up to the rest of the board members whether they agree with you on that, that concern. Um, other board members, Bruce. Um, uh, I chatted with Janet about this quite a while back. Uh, but uh, perhaps I just want to clear. I, I know that when we went through this uh, last time, I think I said that um, having had some concerns, uh, largely because I probably didn't fully understand. And then, uh, Nate, particularly with your summary, which was even more detailed than it was tonight, I think I concluded that I was satisfied with a lot of my concerns uh with single exception and that was the 250 uh threshold number and i asked you where did that come from and uh, you you gave a full answer but included in the full answer was something about stuff sticking to walls and uh, so forth and i asked you whether you would uh, provide uh, some examples and you have and uh, uh so um and the examples were that, uh, as you read, and it seems to me that most of the establishments, uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, the thresholds, the, the, their occupancies are quite low. Uh, I mean, relative to 250. Um, Johnny's was 175. I'm wondering whether Janet's concerns, although um, actually I'll break here. I, got, I just want to ask a clarifying question for a moment. Um, I think I understand correctly that that the public notifications, hearings, about us notice, and so forth, is still applies when there is a site plan review hearing, right? So all of those SPRs are going to involve about us receiving notices, and there will be a public hearing, and people can ask questions. Is that correct, Nate? That's true. So I guess what Janet is saying that is. You know, once the site plan review is already approved, uh, there can be an administrative approval if there are no changes to the exterior or something, you know, if there's a new establishment comes in. Okay. Uh, and so that, I think that's the concern is that, but, you know, that administrative approval happens now. But yes, a site plan review does require a hearing and, you know, butter notices and 
Okay, that helps me to understand Janet's concern a little uh, more. Uh, but continue with my concern, I guess, still is that the 250 number seems pretty high. And it would seem that uh, Janet's concerns, or at least my, to the extent that I share Janet's concerns, uh, it, it would be ameliorated by lowering that threshold. And, and so a question then, my question is, is there any structural problem, any administrative problem, any kind of problem that would be in just taking that down to, I don't know, 175, for example. In other words, because I'm thinking about the, the rather large uh, commercial uh, area in, in, in North Amherst. I mean, these, these uh, posse little, uh, uh, spot almost essentially spot zone limited business and and uh, business uh, neighborhood businesses and so forth that are around um, uh, one thing they are kind of in the neighborhoods but they're quite small but up in North Amherst we have quite a large area of uh, well uh, uh, village center business and then an even larger section of, uh, section of, of commercial and um, whereas I can see something like Johnny's arriving under the process that you're describing, but anything much bigger than that uh, might be something that I'd be concerned about. So on the basis of what you've presented and, and the data so far as the uh, examples of existing enterprises and their occupancies, I would, I guess it feels like I would be more comfortable if the threshold number was lowered but let's simply reduce it as a question. Is there any problem? Uh, does, does it make it difficult in any way if that threshold was lowered from 250 to, let's say, 200 or 175? Okay. I think 175 is getting low enough where some things that may be uh, currently site plan review and then might have to all of a sudden be special permit. So, you know, Johnny's is an example. Um, I think yeah. you know 200 is a safer number where, you know, um, you know existing establishments, you know, wouldn't all of a sudden become non-compliant or have to become you know a special permit just because of their occupancy, even though they were permitted through site plan review. Um, Rob may know better, but I think you know the lower you go, the the more complicated it could get depending on size. So I think you know maybe 200 is a would be a better better it, number. It, it just seems um, to me that there are most of these uh, buildings are well below that. And uh, 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 I mean, all of the others are below 100. Why don't uh, we see what, Rob's got his hand up. Uh, Rob, would you like to say something? I, I just wanted to mention um, that the occupant load also includes staff. So just to, to have that in mind that when you get up to the 175 to 200 or, or 200 plus, um, it's not uncommon for a, a busy night to have, you know, 30 staff, uh, you know, as part of that count. So um, I just want to make sure you're aware of that. And, and it was, you know, it was thought to be a comfortable number at 250. Uh, from our experience, uh, it was what we had recommended to, to Nate in the planning department. Um, I don't think we have any establishment at 250 other than the hangar. Uh, the closest is the monkey bar at 240. And then it starts to drop at 225 for the ginger garden. And then most of the other establishments are at that hot, you know, 180, 190. And that's what we're really seeing uh, with um, the newer establishments that are coming forward, such as protocol and the oyster bar. Those are, those are just under 200 for an occupant load. Uh, so I just wanted to, to let you know that it also includes the staffing that would be on, on site during the, the time of operation. Thank you, Rob. And, and, and it's my understanding that the occupant load is not the actual number of seats. It's, it's the code calculated occupancy based on the area of the serving area. That's right. Um, and, and it's actually includes in most of these establishments now a standing area only. So there's there's bar seating and then there's standing area behind the bar that calculates square footage that allows a certain number of occupants to be there in that area. So an establishment, um, you know, such as uh, uh, protocol that's that's proposing 170 occupants might only have 80 or 90 seats, you know, at tables. The rest of it could be standing and uh, bar seating. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, Tom, you've got your hand up. You're next. Sure. Thanks, Doug. I mean, I just had a quick comment um, in that I feel like I've, you know, I've been on this you know, committee for quite some time. And every time a new project comes up, it's all about how do we how do we create more commercial space? And all of a sudden I feel like now we're trying to restrict that space, like how it's used. And and as Rob said, the 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 scale of the space isn't just the numbers of people, it's actually related to the square footage and how many people can actually fit into those spaces. And so I think making more requirements and more challenge for people to open those businesses or manage those businesses is usually problematic given the climate that we've been asking for for so many years. How do we how do we create more and more commercial space? Let's not try to restrict what's available. Let's actually try to capitalize on, on the opportunities and streamline it to the best of our ability, which I think is what Nate's trying to accomplish through this particular um, this particular document. So, I, I mean, I, I support it and I, I have a sense that it has a trickle down effect of, you know, let's make sure that we can streamline, you know, commercial businesses downtown as, as much as possible, as opposed to putting roadblocks up in front of them based on their square footage and based on the number of occupants. So you're generally, you're obviously supportive. Correct. Okay. Uh, Bruce, you're next. Uh, I just want to uh, comment in relation to what Rob uh, has just said that, yes, uh, I, I guess in, in a clinical sense, we can be cognizant of uh, those occupancies, including staff and standing and so forth. But what for me is more significant, more useful is simply the, uh, the establishments that, uh, that Nate presented and Rob, you added to as being examples of establishments that have occupancies of 175, 180, 190. Um, and uh, because I can relate to that and, and, uh, and, and I'm somewhat familiar with uh, code related occupancies, of course, because I've spent 50 years in the business. But even notwithstanding that, it's much easier for me to, in, in considering this to say, well, do I want something bigger than Johnny's to be uh, um, uh, um, be exempt from, or uh, would I prefer something larger than Johnny's to go through a, a special permit process? And I think the answer is that I would. Um, it doesn't seem to be particularly onerous because there are so few that will reach that threshold. And when you get into places, as I've mentioned, that seems to be quite reasonable that, um, that, uh, that those few establishments that are larger than that would be enterprises that I think would expect to uh, have uh, this more, um, this kind of uh, approval process. So it doesn't seem to be uh, something that would uh, get in the way of, or it would add to the town's reputation or affect the town's reputation so far as business friendliness is concerned, because it will be a small fraction of the proposed new or any proposed new establishments that would be affected by that. So um, it's 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 the it's thinking about the kind of establishments that have that occupancy threshold around 200 below and above that I'll be thinking about in relation to how I feel about this. In all other respects, as I say, I think this is uh, excellent. I think it's really important that uh, this experience has been uh, uh, codified, uh, recent experience, and that the uh, and that the board has uh, and the town has taken and the staff have taken this initiative, which I support in every respect. Uh, with uh, I may be persuaded in the course of subsequent conversation tonight to to shift from that. Um, proposal to lower the threshold to 200, but right now that's where I stand. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Nate, uh, what do you want from us tonight? Do you want us to vote on a recommendation to town council or are you simply looking for our feedback? Well, it's been referred to you. So, I mean, if you're comfortable, then it would be a recommendation, um, you, know, you know, unless you need more information or have, you know, lingering questions. Um, you know, we have looked at it before. There were some minor changes made. Uh, so it's really, I guess, you know, how comfortable the planning board is with the, the proposal. Okay, thank you. Janet? Um, so I'm actually supportive of, you know, many of these changes and I didn't, you know, I could go through those. Um, um, I'm a little confused about the changes in the BN because I think those are significant where 
prohibited uses are now being allowed. Um, and that wasn't really brought out. But I do think, like, I don't think anybody can look at Amherst and say, wow, we don't have many restaurants or bars. <laughs> and so I don't, I'm not saying let's throw roadblocks in the way. I don't think the ZBA is a roadblock to opening Johnny's or Mission Cantina. Um, I think it's just, if, if it's a larger establishment, if it's open after 1130, if it's close to residents where people sleep, and I'm, you know, I live in South Amherst, so I'm thinking about, you know, people who live around Atkins Corner, people who live around Pomeroy, you know, um, which has a lot of low income housing, um, and then maybe down by um, whatever East Amherst, like College Street and um, Southeast Street, which will has a lot of low income housing people living there and more. And if a Johnny's came in and had outdoor dining past 11:30 or outdoor music, you know, it, and it came in their site plan review using an existing building, say maybe Spirit House or something, net, goes on site plan review, goes to the building commissioner, no notice to anybody. No, so I, I just don't think we want to go there. I don't think going to the ZBA and noticing the butters, inviting the community to come in and talk about their concerns, having the ZBA listen and draft conditions. If we're going through the building commissioner, nobody would know the, the permit was applied for that he was considering it or her in the future and when he made a decision or when it could be appealed. And so you could wake up and the spirit house is now a Johnny's, you know, and open after 1130 at night, um, people stumbling out, not, you know, not Johnny's, but, you know, okay. going down to students live around there too. And so I don't know, I don't see the problem with the current situation. I think the current distinction based on proximity drinking time of night it ends you know whatever they all made sense and they work i don't see the problems that we're having right now okay thank you rob so and i and i just want to respond to that because i i think it, it all makes sense as you presented janet but what really happens is, and, and I can name off the establishments that have done this, is they come to me and they ask for a permit as a class one establishment because they know it's three months of preparation for a special permit hearing and then three months of the special permit hearing process before they have their decision. So they open and operate as a class one restaurant and then some number of months later, they get the authorization to stay open from 1130 to one. Otherwise, nothing has changed. Uh, the establishment's there, it's open, and really no one would know that anything else has happened, and we don't get any participation from the public in those hearings. That's just my experience that I can you know, talk about over the last 10 years. I think you, I just want to say quickly, too, that if the Spirit House were to change the use and there's outdoor dining now and there's something that would require a site plan review hearing, that just wouldn't be an administrative approval. So if they're going to have significant changes, uh, then that's you know that's a that's an initial site plan review hearing. After the fact, if there's a site plan review on record and that restaurant then changes, and nothing changes, right? The ownership changes. It goes from one type of restaurant to another. Then that's an administrative approval. But the initial change from Spirit House to a restaurant may require site plan review if it has all those changes that Janet mentioned. So outdoor dining or you know later hours or something that is triggering you know a change to the, the appearance. Thank you, Nate. Karen. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very supportive of this. Um, I think that the fears that uh, we're kind of losing control and that all of a sudden something comes up that's gonna be loud music and disturb the people around them. Um, I think there are, um, I, I don't think that can happen without some mitigating controls uh, under what is proposed. It just seems that there's always gonna be that site plan review. That means that the abutters are notified as far as I'm concerned. So um, the, the difficulty of protecting the public from uh, these large noisy things that I'm familiar with because I live in the middle of town and there are a lot of times when students are very loud, but I, I think that the staff has uh, really done a good study of what in reality is happening and how to make it simpler 
Um, and um, I think there is progress. And as, as Nate said, that's the experience of what actually happens. So if the reality is that this is uh, the way it works and it works fine, and they've put all this work in it, I, I can support it. Okay, thank you, Karen. Um, I do see one hand from the public, so I thought I would go to them now since there are no other um, board hands up. Oh, and now there's two hands. So uh, Pam, uh, Pam, let's bring Pam Rooney over. Pam, if you'd give us your name and your address. Hi, Pam. Sure, you have, hi. You have up to three minutes. Wonderful. Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Um, I do have some concerns with this. Um, as I understand it, the, the current bylaws do take a look at hours of operation, the serving of alcohol, proximity to residential buildings, and size of, this, of the building and its capacity. A, a very short story, pizza place, 400, 300 feet from my windows, uh, applied several times to extend their, uh, their hours of operation past 1130. We have corridors clanging, we have people talking loudly, we have people going in and out at that hour. If, if in this scenario, the owner would be able to go to get administrative review um, and say, under, the, under this new bylaw, I can now operate at will until I don't know what, what actually closes down a shop, um, but it's, it's basically they would like to stay open until bars close. So the loud noise, the loud talking would continue until hours of operation ceased. So in this proposal, even though generally speaking, there may not be very many issues, generally speaking, the, the hours of operation are, are critical to adjoining neighborhoods. The serving of alcohol has not been addressed really, um, and proximity to, to the residential areas. So if, if in any consideration that you're making of this, I would agree with Mr. Coldham that the threshold for size of a building or capacity, excuse me, should be more around the 150, he, he mentioned 175, not the 250, because that would be all zones outside of the BG. In the BG, frankly, it doesn't matter. Um, but outside of that, every single B, other BL or COM district is immediately adjacent to a residential district. So you need to consider that. I would, I would agree with it, uh, allowing administrative approval or staff approval for businesses in the BG within existing buildings, no change to site or structure. I would like to see you add a condition H and have a noise impact statement. I think that was addressed in this very last uh, version with some blue type that says maybe there would be some, you know, screening or something to help ameliorate uh, noise impact, but I think I think you really need to look at that again. Add to standard condition number five your management plan. Service of alcohol has not been man has not been mentioned. That has to be a critical element in your management plan. Are you serving alcohol or not? If you're trying to lump out lump all restaurants and most bars into one category, how do you regulate the hours of operation? How do you operate proximity to neighbors? You don't, you've, you've lost that capability. Pam, um, your time is up. I'm, I'm very sorry. I may raise my hand again for my next comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, our second uh, member of the public who wishes to make a comment is Gordon Green. Um, Pam, if you could bring him over and Mr. Green, if you could give us your name and your street address. Hi, uh, my name is Gordon Green. I'm at 150 Montague Road. Thank you. You have three minutes. Okay. Um, I'm sorry I'm not uh, familiar with the subtleties of zoning laws, so these comments might be kind of um, blunt or 
and not, not very articulate, but uh, I live right adjacent to North Square and noise is a problem, uh, particularly outdoor amplified pre-recorded music. Uh, I think one thing that's distinctive about pre-recorded music is that it can go on for hours as opposed to being a, an event. And um, one thing I'd like to point out is that um, the extent to which noise can bother people can be independent of distant to some extent. This, for example, with North Squares, you have these tall buildings that basically act like a speaker funnel. So the noises that there are kind of not very loud actually are quite loud in my living room. So there's a way in which, and that's probably, I don't know, a few hundred feet away. And there's no outdoor dining there now, but they have like, or at least in prior years, this year's there hasn't been much, but in prior years they had so for example, outdoor exercise classes that would go on, you know, most weekend afternoons that would basically, you know, fill my living room with sounds of bass and drums. That was highly annoying. And so one question I have is um, the, 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 the provision that said that entities not labeled or as bars can make sound outside. It was the last of the text changes there. I'm just, uh, I'm just, personally very wary of anything that loosens any rules about outdoor sound, especially outdoor pre-recorded music that isn't tied to like a special event. Um, because of its capacity to uh, uh, interfere with things in unpredictable ways. And also about the zoning board opportunity for review, I just wanted to express the point that, you know, the fact that 99% of cases didn't result in public comment or were approved by the ZBA doesn't mean that the 1% was not critical. So I would just wanna point out that even though the most cases uh, review opportunities may not be important, it's it, the, the question is the cost of the ones you're eliminating. If that 1% you know, would have ruined several people's you know, uh, home value or quality of life, that's a very significant thing, even though it is a rare occurrence. So I just wanted to sort of generally support Janet McGowan's uh, concerns, and um, and as you know, they're especially heightened for me being close to North Square. Um, and uh, I think that's all I had to say. Okay, thank you. Um, Nate or Rob, uh, I wondered if you wanted to respond to any of that, either of those comments, um, particularly how you might you know, handle an application administratively that is in the vicinity of a residential area um, and whether, you know, whether you might just shy away from doing it administratively and automatically move it to the planning board or not. Um, Rob. So I would say in recent years, we, we apply criteria in a similar way, no matter where the location is. Um, I've gotten more complaints downtown than I do in the village centers. And, and there are several, several businesses, several restaurants that are within 150 feet of a residential dwelling in a residential district. Um, but I, you know, we've, we've brought back uh, businesses downtown and amended special permits to help, help, uh, you know, alleviate the impact of, of and we feel like for every application, you know, originated back when we were looking at it just for resident close to residential uses, but really apply everywhere now. Um, you know, we have a lot of residential dwellings downtown and yes, it's expected that it's going to be a little bit noisier downtown when you go to live there, but it can still be managed well and, and the owner of the building or the business can um, can take responsibility for certain things. Uh, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is North Square went through about seven months of public hearings. Uh, and every uh, proposal that goes into that, that complex now does require a hearing, uh, you know, with the exception of what's been done under Article 14, when that expires, the comprehensive permit requires that every new use, uh, either visit the planning board or the zoning board of appeals uh, before that can be authorized. And that'll remain in effect regardless of this, whether this new proposal for the bylaw changes or not? Right, that's a, it's a specific condition of the comprehensive permit. Uh, and, and just 
along those lines, any existing special permit that it, that exists now will remain. That doesn't just automatically disappear by adopting this bylaw. So uh, establishments that have special permits that have specific conditions will continue to be in effect. Okay, thank you. Um, looks like Pam Rooney would like to continue her comment. So Pam, would you bring her back over? Mm -hmm. Hi, Pam. Hi, thank you. I actually did that accidentally. So, <laughs> well, you told us you had more you wanted to say. Well, I have more, and I'd like to actually email um, to Pam the my notes. But um, I guess part of part of what was going through my head when I looked at this is that the current bylaw does look at categories of operational and locational factors. And each of those has some associated level of control or management. So it's the hours of operation, the serving of alcohol, proximity to residential dwellings, and the size. And I guess part of part of what you all are are looking at and evaluating is is I totally trust that Rob Mora and his staff are doing a really good job reviewing these conditions. Do we know when Rob retires, if the person doing it next will have the same level of scrutiny and follow the same standard and condition? So I had several questions that were similar to Janet McGowan's and that is this change actually necessary to improve the viability of existing businesses? And do removing those operational and locational considerations make it easier to issue a permit? And is the change, is this proposed change actually going to improve the quality of life in the adjoining districts who abut business and business neighborhood, business village center, business low, uh, limited business? or commercial. And I think that's the biggest question is, is are these changes going to impact the neighbors of the business districts outside of downtown? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pam. <clears throat> so let's see, I don't see any more public hands. Uh, I see Janet's hand, but uh, uh, I think, uh, Janet, why don't you go ahead and make your comment and then I'm, I think I'm ready to make a motion. So my question is about, you know, how the system works now. Like I haven't, I've been on the planning board for three years. I've never seen a special permit, a site plan review permit application for a restaurant, partly because COVID has been around, but my, my suspicion is, is that most of those just go to the building commissioner because there's no real change to the outside of the building when they have a new establishment. So if somebody did apply for site plan review, it was coming to the planning board or a special permit for a restaurant, bar restaurant, whatever, um, a class, you know, you know, so they would file their, their application, there'd be a public notice, we'd have one or two hearings, make a decision, that's a six month process for the ZBA. I mean, has that been a six month process for the planning board? Is that your question? For, for That's my first question. I have a question about the business neighborhood because about the expansion of it. So, uh, Rob, what or Nate, what's the, the, the typical process, the duration? Uh, I, I think you'll find that it is about six months. Uh, and, you know, when an applicant shows up at the at, at town hall and says, I want to open a restaurant, that's when they start to learn what's necessary to satisfy all the special permit uh, submission requirements. And site plan review isn't much different. You know, Chris might might have a comment on the, the length of time because I don't work with those um, that closely. Uh, but I do with the Zoning Board of Appeals applications and they often take uh, a number of months to get get the applications together. For example, you know the they find out when they when they come into town and they want to open a restaurant. That's when the applicant finds out that they need architect's plans or a a site plan or a, a lighting study or whatever you know whatever it might be. 
uh, and a, a written management plan. And they, they work on that for uh, whatever length of time is necessary for the application to be deemed complete. And then it's clocked in and starts the process. And as you know, the board's not available for a hearing for six, seven, eight weeks. And, and there's one or two hearings and then there's an appeal period. So it just goes on and on. And, and you know, back to an earlier comment about um, special permitting just in general, um, I do get calls. I get calls from prospective business owners and asking specifically what is the process to run, open a restaurant. And I've had, I've had prospective applicants disappear, you know, once they hear it's a special permit, you can go to Northampton and it's a yes, it's not even a site plan review. It's a yes, come open your restaurant here. We're telling them it's a special permit. Now, I think our special permits are very, uh, we're, we support them. We help applicants get through the process. We try to make their, their projects uh, appear very well to the, to the board and be ready for the board to review. But, but applicants don't have that experience in other communities and they see special permit, hear special permit, and they go the other way. And I think we do lose businesses because of that. Um, and it's really, um, really difficult to, um, to justify the time frame that's needed uh, for some of these smaller establishments. And, you know, it's all of that is part of, you know, supporting why we're proposing this. So, Rob, right. you don't, thank you, you Rob. Don't, What's your sorry. second question, Janet? Well, I was wondering what Rob requires. Like, do you require all that preliminary stuff too? And my second question is, I'm just really perplexed about the BN because it seems like you've added, like, you know, you can have a, now you can have a bar with no food in the BN. Now you can have a nightclub um, in the BN before that was all, all the things that were no's are now in the BN. And yet there's still this like nine o'clock limit on alcohol and 30 seat capacity. And I just seemed to me that the, the language didn't make sense. So it seems like you're expanding what can happen in the BN and then it, no one can drink after nine. And so I just, I just found that confusing. Like, okay. why are you expanding it? And then what happens at nine? All right. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Nate, do you want to take that one? Or is that Rob? <clears throat> you know, currently it's, um, you know, what we're proposing is, you know, except for a restaurant, uh, you know, bar with food or a similar establishment, that's site plan review, the rest is special permit. But then we have the condition that it has to have no more than 30 seats. So, you know, those are the limiting conditions. So yeah, if a, if a bar wants to have 29 seats and close at 930, it's allowed in the BN. I mean, those, those conditions regulate it. And it says it can't be within a certain distance of a residential building in a residential district. So, you know, the BN really is six properties. And if you if you take that distance requirement, there's about you know two properties where there could be a food or drink establishment actually located in the BN. And so we're not opening the BN up to you know a nightclub. Uh, those those that condition uh, in terms of hours, seating, and distance will greatly limit what can happen in the BN district. All right, thank you, Nate. All right. Um, in the interest of moving this along, I'm going to make. I would like to move that the board recommend to town council the proposal as proposed by Nate. Um, if anybody would like to second that, that, then we can move on to whether anybody wants to make any motions to change any parts of it before we vote on it. Tom, I second that motion. All right. Thank you, Tom. Uh, any discussion from the board? We've heard certain members advocate for adjustments to some of the conditions, some of the parts of the proposal. Bruce, you are muted. There I, you I uh, would you accept a friendly amendment to uh, uh, add uh, with the condition that, with the understanding that the uh, 250 threshold is lowered to 200. Um, I'm going to reject it as a friendly am amendment. So let's do it as a, a regular amendment. Uh, so would somebody like to second that motion? Karen? I second. To reduce from 250 to 200, I believe. Yes. 
Okay, thank you. Um, any discussion from the board? All right, so we'll go through and we'll vote on Bruce's uh, amendment, uh, reducing the occupancy limit uh, beyond which uh, I believe a special permit is always required. Um, so a, a vote in favor of that. Okay, Janet, you have a comment? You are muted. Are we voting to recommend that the town council take this and send it back to us? Um, well, the way the process works is that uh, amendments go to town council and then they move it to us for a public hearing on uh, you know final adoption. So Chris, uh, you can correct me, but I believe the answer is it will come back to us. No, no. This has been referred to the planning board for a public hearing. Okay. And the planning board now makes a recommendation to town council, and it won't come back unless town council sends it back. Okay. Thank I'm you. Sorry, I'm, I'm I, really. I I thought that you were going to the planning department was going to send that to town council, and then it would come back to us for. This is the public hearing on the amendment on the zoning amendments. I don't think we said that last meeting. Okay, I just don't think they're okay. I just don't think it's ready. Okay, but I, I, I support. I... Okay. Well, thanks for that clarification, Chris. All right. Um, let's see. Where were we? We were we were voting. We were discussing whether to amend uh, Nate's proposal by reducing the two hundred and fifty to two hundred, and so we were going to vote on that particular question first. Um, so, uh, board members, I'll go through a roll call. Um, Bruce, would you like to support that? Yes, aye. All right. Um, Tom. May. Andrew. Nay. That was a nay? Correct. I can't Thank hear you. people. Were those no's? Um, yeah, uh, mine, mine was a no. I'm sorry, my name Andrew or nay. Yes. Janet. So this is just to support reducing the number, but not to particularly support the whole thing. Correct. I'm a yay. <laughs> okay. You're, you're, you're reduced. Okay, yes. I'm not voting on the whole thing though. Okay. I don't think it's ready. Okay. Uh Karen. Yes. All right. And I'm a nay. So that's uh, three opposed and three in favor. Chris, uh, am I correct that the motion fails or does it carry? I think the motion fails because it doesn't have a majority. OK. All right. Um, so why don't we move on to the overall motion, unless anybody wants to make any other motions for changing this before we have the vote. <clears throat> well, I do see Pam Rooney's hand, and uh, I guess I'll, Pam uh, Sitfield Sadler, can you bring her over for a moment? Hi, Pam, you should be. Pam, uh, why don't you try to say your, what you need to say in one minute? I'll say it succinctly. I didn't speak at all to Article 5, Article 11, or Article 12. In Article 12, there is no nightclub definition. Can you please add one? Article 1, 11.212, a change of use is proposed, yet the proposed changes to Section 3.52 could mean that any restaurant could change to a bar without any restrictions of hours of operation or proximity to residents. So please request that that clause be removed since having only admin review and approval, a change of use is an important change that needs to be considered outside of administrative permitting only. Article five, please keep as a principal food and drink purpose, not wide open to any and all section 3.3 uses from the table. 
same goes with music. If it's under site plan review, that no longer requires operational or locational restrictions. And that went to the speaker that lives on Monte, Montague Road. That means that all restaurants and many bars that can allow outdoor music will be able to do so with only administrative review. I don't think that's appropriate. Thank you. And I'd love some discussion on the points that I brought up earlier uh, as to how you might incorporate those into the bylaw. Thank you, Pam. Uh, Janet? Um, partly because I'm startled that we're recommending this for town council, and I didn't think that's where we were, but I, I, I would like to move that we send this to the dormant zoning subcommittee for some more analysis and fine tooth combing. I don't think it's ready to go. Um, it's just there's there's let you know wording problems, some confusion, but also there's you know a fundamental some fundamental issues. I don't think we've really assessed out. So, all right, I'd like to make a motion to refer to the subcommittee, the zoning subcommittee, which has been on hiatus for two years. Well, uh, since we have a pre-existing motion. Why don't we vote on that? And you know, if the, if the motion fails, then we can talk about what to do with it next. Anybody else have any comment? Otherwise, we'll vote. Uh, Karen. Yeah. So a lot of the comments of Pam um, Pam Rooney, I take very seriously, and I do agree with her. So um, I wonder, can Rob Mora address those particular concerns before we have to vote? Mm -hmm. Well, we can ask him. Rob, I don't know if you caught uh, all of the specific comments that Pam made. Were there any that you would like to comment on? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I, I take those as suggestions or recommendations to do something different than we proposed. And, and I think that's fine. Um, you know, obviously, as Nate mentioned, we are, um, we, we are trying to take this in a different direction than the current bylaw reads. Uh, we're trying to deal with um, avoiding uh, situations where the, there's gaming of the bylaw by applying under one condition and transferring to another one. Uh, but specifically to a couple of Pam's comments, change of use, uh, there's a lot of change of uses that occur that are not restaurants. So I would not be in favor of changing that provision. We, we uh, use the change of use for any establishment that might have been previously something else, retail office space, and, and move it into something else, not necessarily a, uh, uh, a restaurant. Uh, so I... I I don't think I have comments about much of the other com uh, the, the, the suggestions uh, at this time, though. So thank you. OK, thank you. And Nate, I don't see your hand, so I assume you are not have nothing to say at this point either. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Pam had mentioned having, you know, um, maybe like a noise management plan uh, in the in standards and conditions. And, you know, I, you know, looking at what we have, um, in there, we have, you know, um, and, you know, it shall operate in accordance with an, uh, you know, an approved, we list, you know, uh, eight things. And one is a patron management plan uh, for the interior and exterior. And we say such things as queuing, and we could just put parenthetically noise. We also then mentioned that the management plan has to deal with uh, noise attenuation, containment, and response to complaints, as well as strategies to screen and buffer adjacent properties from noise and other impacts. And so, I mean, I feel like it's it's there. It's just a matter of how much do you want to tweak the language. Um, you know, she did mention that staff may do a good job now and not in the future. And so, you know, we asked for hours of operation. Is it that we, um, you know, again, add some language to say if open after 1130, um, you know, uh, add extra, um, you know, management for, um, you know, closing or something. And so I, you know, I'm not sure we would necessarily then change the restaurant cafe or anything to from site plan review to special permit, but we could have um, acknowledgement in the management form or what's submitted, uh, have something written that then becomes a condition we could put on the establishment. And so that's what we've been finding works really well. So even with article 14, 
you know, there is a written decision, there's conditions. Uh, and what we found in the last 20 years with the zoning board is that we've standardized, you know, like 50 sets, 50 conditions that we've kind of been able to address management, whether it's noise, it's queuing, it's closing, and then we can deal with it because it's a condition and it's enforceable. And so, you know, what we're asking for now in the standards and conditions in the proposed use chart get us there. It gets us to a set of conditions that can be enforced. And so, um, you know, if we need to strengthen some language in that, you know, in those A through H uh, standards and conditions, we could do that. Um, I'm not sure it would, you know, staff would have to consider, does that mean we would make something, a, site, a special permit where we're recommending a site plan review right now? I think we would just include better language in the, you know, in those conditions. Okay. So as I understand it, you're going to get a recommendation, if you get a recommendation from us this evening, um, you still have the latitude to adjust the language before it gets to town council. We're not, we're not, uh, we're not recommending a final uh, set of proposals. Chris? I think you need to recommend a final set of proposals. And if you're not happy with what is being presented to you, you can continue the public hearing and have Nate come back with um, changes to the conditions that may satisfy some, some of your uh, concerns. Okay, thank you. So board members, based on the comments we've received and the comments that you all have made, are there other proposals to change anything or does anyone want to call the question? Andrew. Thanks, Doug. I was just wondering um, if Nate made those changes. So if, if Nate made the changes, when would we be able to see this again? I mean, I, I, I see there's a lot of passion around some minor changes. I'm I'm personally comfortable with the, the motion as is, the proposal as is, but if this is something where two weeks of revisions can you know assuage others fears then i'm i'm comfortable with waiting that time i just would not feel good if this has to get pushed back another two or three or four months thank you andrew good point um chris is your hand up as a legacy no i wanted to say that you could bring it back on the 16th of november if you wanted to okay so that would be our next meeting all right uh janet um, I do have changes, but I'm not, I didn't, I mean, I have changes I'd like to make, but I didn't, I'm not prepared at this minute to do that. And I, you know, so I would love to be able to talk maybe to the staff about them and stuff like that, perhaps through the zoning subcommittee, but I don't, I would do like specific changes in language. I didn't, I wasn't prepared. I didn't think we were at that point. Sorry. Okay. All right. So, um, I'm not seeing any more hands from the board. Uh, why, Pam failed Sadler. Why don't you bring uh, Gordon Green over uh, from the public? Oh, hi, just a quick comment. Um, it seems to me with these zoning changes and zoning exceptions that there are often unintended consequences and that caution is in order. And it just seems to me that given the extent of the uh, possible effects on residents' lives that you consider it carefully, and if it takes a little more time to do it, that I don't know. That all sounds reasonable to me. I just wanted to throw that in there. Okay, thank you. All right, so why don't we close out the process we're in the middle of? Uh, I don't see any hands from the board or the attendees. And so why don't we go ahead and vote on the original motion, which was to recommend this package as proposed by Nate to town council. So a no vote will allow us to talk about moving this to a later meeting and having later change, you know, emailing Nate or Chris with more suggested edits and Nate can bring another version to the next meeting. Okay, so a yes vote is in favor of recommending tonight and moving on, and a no vote is in favor of uh, not recommending tonight, and therefore we're likely to see it again. All right, so Bruce. 
Doug, would you let me um, pass for the moment and uh, uh, vote at the end? Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tom. I'm sorry, I had to step out for a moment. Are we voting? Yes, so a yes vote is in favor of uh, adopt or recommending this evening and a no vote is to not recommend this evening, in which case we'll probably have a chance to talk more. I, uh, I vote to recommend this evening. Okay, thank you. Andrew? With, with the um, belief that this would be, you know, at the, our next meeting and that would give time for Janet to share her thoughts uh, on paper, I'll say nay. Okay. And Janet? Um, nay, also the same idea. All right. And Karen? Nay, I agree. Okay. And I am uh, uh, an I in favor of voting the seat of recommending this package. And Bruce, that leaves you. Well, I'll vote nay. I wanted to register that I supported this, but if there was a, um, uh, if, if there was going to be a fourth to, uh, two vote, I was going to be a nay, but I'll continue to be a nay. Okay, so the motion fails. And uh, Chris, I guess we'll have to put this on the agenda for November 16th. So you'll and have to take a vote to continue the public continue hearing, hearing to November right. 16th. And um, Janet, uh, I urge you to communicate with Chris with any suggestions you are interested in, Nate, considering for when okay. he brings it, this back in two weeks. Thank you. Okay, so uh, would anybody like to make a motion to continue the hearing? Bruce. So moved. So we're, we're to the continue to the, the hearing to and uh, we need a time, Chris. Yes. I don't think we have anything um, established for the 16th. Am I right, Pam? That is correct. At this time, there is nothing that has a time. We could say 635 on the 16th. Okay. Bruce, that yes. That sounds good. Okay, Andrew. Second. All right. And Karen, your hand is up. Um, no, I was second. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, any discussion yeah. about uh, continuing to the sixteenth? I don't see any, so we'll go ahead and vote on that. Bruce. Yes. And Tom. No. Nope. Andrew. Aye. And Janet. Aye. And Karen. Aye. And I'm an aye since I want to get this back on the agenda and finished up. All right, so that passed uh, five to one. This uh, hearing is clear, is, is, is continued to November 16th, uh, sometime after 635. All right, so at this time it's quarter of nine and uh, actually 844. Um, we'll take a five minute break. Please come back at 10 minutes before nine. Turn off your video and mute your microphone. Thank you.
Zum Rischen schon bald der Boarding Fee. Auch das mit den Restaurants. No? Karen, you are not muted. Oh, oh sorry. All right, the time is 8.50. So uh, if you are within earshot, please come on back and uh, turn on your camera to let us know that you are ready to re-engage. <laughs> Chris, you have your hand up. I don't know if you're ready to say something or if that's a legacy. Yeah, I'm ready to say something. Um, this uh, next um, piece of your agenda is an important piece. And um, you received documents last week and you received um, draft conditions and findings. But this week um, we received more documents within the last 48 hours. And so I think it would be reasonable for you to um, have a presentation and discuss the project and figure out what you need to um, have moving forward in order to be able to vote on this, but not necessarily to feel like you have to vote tonight because there were um, things that came in even within the last you know, day mm -hmm. um, on the project that you haven't had a chance to review. So right. uh, my recommendation would be um, hear the presentation, uh, discuss it, but then continue the public hearing to a date in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Oh, one more thing, Pam, I wonder if you could bring Kyle Wilson in. I think he's in the attendees. Thank you. Are we, are, have we re all returned from break? No, well, we're not all back quite yet. Okay. Oops. It looks like we're missing Bruce. Okay, so Kyle has joined us. Thank you. Okay. There's Bruce. Okay. All right. All right, so we'll continue here. The time is now 8.52, and we'll move on to item five on our agenda, a site plan review and special permit public hearing. Um, let's see. Okay, in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this joint public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2023-01 and SPP 2023-01 Archipelago Investments LLC 47 Olympia Drive. Uh, this uh, hearing is continued from August 3rd, uh, September 7th, September 21st, and October 9th, 19th, all of this year. Joint public hearing to request site plan review approval under section 3.326 of the zoning bylaw to construct a private apartment style dormitory with 68 dwelling units and associated interior and exterior spaces and associated site improvements, including waiver of on-site parking requirements and a special permit to modify maximum building coverage 
and height requirements under section six, table three, footnote A of the zoning bylaw, map D parcel 18 in the RF zoning district. And uh, I know there have been a little bit of publicity or uh, press coverage of this or letters to the editor in which there might've been some confusion, but the RF zoning district is, for, uh, is zoned for fraternities and sororities. So student housing is essentially what is allowed in this area. So um, Mr. Wilson, I believe you're here to make a presentation on the latest plans for this project. If you'll go ahead, welcome. I, I am, thank you. Uh, thanks for everybody's time. And I agree with what Chris Brestrup said earlier uh, to open this that um, since we last saw you, we've been before the Conservation Commission on the 14th of September, the 28th of September, the 12th of October, and the 26th of October. So our last meeting was just uh, uh, last week. Um, and I will very quickly go through, if I can share a screen, is that, can I do that, Pam? You should be able to. Mm -hmm. mm. You can't? Yeah. Okay. Not yet, no. There it is. You got it. Got it. Okay, perfect. Can you see me there? Yep. Yes. Okay, so I'll show you what we presented to Conservation Commission through the number of meetings. Uh, this is the uh, landscape plan uh, that went to the Conservation Commission. There's kind of two sides to this landscape plan facing uh, the street and then facing uh, the uh, conservation area to the uh, east. Um, this is the plan that conservation has settled on. This is um, in coordination with the civil plan. Uh, that SVE spent a lot of time on, which I'll show here. Uh, the civil plan, uh, a number of um, uh, revisions to the civil plan that show uh, the new wetland bylaw regulations, which came in in June in terms of setbacks, uh, show the uh, stormwater, uh, show grading uh, in terms of how the stormwater is dealt with going to the east and to the wetland and to the west and to the street and the infrastructure. Um, test pits were dug, uh, infiltration was measured, uh, the retain it and underground structures were uh, moved around and uh, worked to everybody's uh, 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 agreement um, and have got us to a point where conservation is just uh, as an email that went from Aaron uh, Jocks to Chris Brestrup said is, is at the final stages of, of approving the project. Um, and Chris can clarify that if I misspoke in any way. Uh, the updated architectural drawings uh, show uh, a couple of items. One is uh, bicycle parking on the north. Uh, it also shows in subsequent plans, the other change to this, which is a manager's apartment which we've integrated onto the ground floor, similar to 57 Olympia to the north, um, and was one of the concerns from previously. Uh, and then we've also, all the upper four plans have stayed the same. The connector with the amenities have stayed the same. Uh, the roof has stayed the same. Uh, the height and elevations have all remained the same. Uh, we kept the height, uh, the, the pink uh, height on there to uh, have clarity in terms of what was being measured off of what. Um, we did remove the access to the back. So as you'll see here, there used to be stairs down to an area that has become a, um, a, uh, a viewing deck only rather than accessible to the back as we worked with stormwater and made the retainage work uh, on the east side of the site. And I'm sorry, I'll show you that on the floor plan as well. So you can see this covered porch here. Uh, previously there were stairs down and there were some uh, the resolution of grading and, and so on was, was difficult to resolve. So that's become a dead end and a covered porch and a viewing porch, which you'll see on the elevations. Uh, 
We've updated the renderings also uh, to show, to integrate with the, the landscape plan, which I can uh, talk through you in terms of uh, how we address the street, how we address the courtyard. Um, you'll see there's a very large landscape elements, stone elements similar to our 11 East Pleasant project downtown um, that, that will create the space within the landscape and, and work with the scale of the building and the scale of uh, the people in the courtyard. So you'll see these larger elements, a singular tree, uh, there's stormwater underneath portions of that. Uh, this area is um, has uh, shade loving plants, has a lot of uh, um, flowering plants. So it's kind of a cultivated garden. The site that you see through the back is more of the, the native garden and all the native plants that, that fade to the wetland um, on the east, as you can see here. So a different plant palette on the east uh, with a pollinator seed mix um, and native plants. And as you can see, this the stairs have gone away and this is now a, a viewing deck out the back. The materials have all stayed the same. Um, we also, let's see, we've got a, we updated the management plan to include the manager's apartment. Um, we have, uh, Stormwater has updated the stormwater management and maintenance plan, which has been sent to Jason Skeels and town engineer and he's gotten back and forwarded to Chris and I believe is in your packet. Um, I did take a picture recently that I wanted to show you. I forwarded to Chris. This is nine something on a, uh, an evening or a, a morning a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that's the PVTA bus loop. In this case, it's route 35. There's route 34, 35 and 36 that all stop at this bus stop. And this is 57 Olympia, 47 Olympia is right behind this is how most people occupy and, and move them around the site. Um, I did want to show you utilities. This is from the town's GIS because that has come up. Um, and in talking with uh, Jason Skeels and talking with Tony Maroulis and Shane Conklin at UMass, uh, I have a better understanding of how the utility history went um, and how the town took title to Olympia Drive how uh, there are some easements relative to water and sewer around Authority Way, um, and then how, uh, you know, as owners of 57 Olympia and 47, uh, the deeded rights that we have for these other parcels and the access to the utilities uh, makes this uh, a fairly straightforward connection uh, onto Mather and then down to uh, Olympia uh, for water and sewer. Um, this is Route 35, which is uh, the southbound loop campus shuttle. There's a northbound loop. As you can see for Olympia Drive here, the bus comes very frequently uh, right past the site. Um, and then I, we do have a parking exhibit uh, in terms of pickup and drop off and working with the uh, uh, existing parking on site. These are the sites that these are the spaces that were uh, used by Kyle Omega in the past. These are spaces that were are currently used for handicap and visitor parking uh, for the Mather building. Uh, this is uh, the uh, proposed renovation of that to allow for handicap spaces, additional handicap spaces along the street and some additional visitor spaces, uh, make the grading work, make the sidewalk work uh, and work within the utilities that are under Mather. Um, and I believe, I believe that's it. I wanted to be able to get to questions as, uh, as soon as I could. Thank you, Kyle. One, one quick question about the last, uh, civil drawing you just showed about the parking exhibit, yep. I think, um, is that kind of work, you know, uh, you've been in contact with UMass about, uh, getting their agreement for you to do work on that that land? Uh, yes, did have a conversation. Uh, they, we talked about our deeded rights to all of these areas. We talked about the history of utilities in the town that connect through uh, Olympia, uh, the need to connect uh, our utility, to upgrade the existing utilities in Mather and our ability to do so. Talking with UMass about how we can manage that in terms of doing work on state land, um, our current contractor, Western Builders, uh, who uh, is going to build this building is currently doing a lab on UMass campus. So uh, very well versed in how to um, make that happen in the appropriate manner. Okay. And I wondered whether uh, you've showed one of your uh, larger site plans of the whole 
Olympia Drive area. Um, yep. Whether you could show that, or if you also, or if you in fact have the original subdivision plan uh, that shows the five sites which are to be retained for parking, so that the board understands which which parts of the of the subdivision you have rights to park in. Sure. Uh, so this is the 1971 map, the original uh, subdivision map. Um, this is the, the IOTA chapter of Sigma 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 is 57 Olympia. The IOTA beta chapter of Chi Omega is 47 Olympia before you. Zeta 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 was the, is the UMass building that was built. Um, these two parcels up here, Lambda Delta Phi uh, and uh, Alpha Gamma Rho were purchased but never built upon. Uh, the deeded, uh, the rights for parking and recreation are five. It's the one north of Olymp 57 Olympia here. It's the one in the center that says fraternity sorority. It's this ear-shaped parcel. It's this ear-shaped parcel, that's four. And it's this long parcel, that's five. Um, okay. uh, and those are, the, uh, those are the spaces that any of the owners of within this subdivision have deeded rights to. Thank you. Thank you. All right, board members, questions for Kyle? Oh, we don't want you to leave the meeting. I didn't, I, that was, I, that was. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andrew. Thanks, Doug, and thanks, Kyle. Um, I, I guess I'd maybe confuse him because you were seeking parking waivers, I believe, right? Um, but, but residents can park in these lots by right? The, the, the deeded rights of any, pri of any owner of one of these 12 parcels are such that uh, the, own, the user, those, the folks who use that property can use those five parcels by right. Those parcels are all currently under the ownership in one of four different ways of the uh, Commonwealth of Mass. Um, this is what was set up and what we're utilizing for the parking north of us at 57 Olympia, which has gone very well. And the same thing that we're proposing for 47. Um, okay, so the, I was thinking that the, the parking to the Northwest was a, like a UMass sticker parking lot. Is that the case? That and is, I guess in, in those stickered lots, how would a resident be able to access that? That is correct. So the history of the site is that as, as these sites um, became uh, managed by the university, uh, they, they received permits. And so anybody parking there needed to get a permit. And so anybody that's at 57 or 47 who wants to park there uh, needs to get a permit from the university. Okay, and they could do that through your management office or they would have to go to the university for that? That's the university. Okay. Uh, okay. Kyle, Kyle, are you only renting these rooms to UMass students or might an Amherst College or Hampshire College student end up in one of these uh, and not be able to get a permit from UMass? Uh, we rent to uh, matriculating students. Uh, the vast majority are the University of Massachusetts. There have been students from uh, from Amherst College, I think Mount Holyoke even. Um, I, we have not had any, we have not from the management standpoint had any issues with parking um, and don't expect to have any issues with parking at 47 Olympia. I think that the reason most people, uh, one of the benefits of this housing is that there is a bus loop that stops every 10 minutes immediately outside of your door. That is a campus loop that takes you right to the center of campus. It's, un, it's almost unlike any other housing in, uh, in town. All right, Bruce. Um, yes, um, I want to pursue this uh, parking uh, question a little further um, because uh, um, we're being asked to grant a waiver on the one hand, but Kyle, you're telling us that the uh, the the um, the project has parking entitlement, um, and and I think I, uh, I I want 
before I can, uh, maybe I should preface this by saying, I think this is a terrific project and I wanna be supportive uh, ultimately. Uh, but the parking piece is just been wildly confusing to me. Uh, the idea that we're, um, I mean, uh, on the surface, of, not on the surface, uh, the one line summary is because it's the in the application that we're asking for a complete, you're asking and we're being asked to grant a complete parking waiver. And I think we, uh, we need to uh, make the record very clear about what this means. And, uh, and I think what you're saying is that we are being asked to grant a waiver for parking on the site, but uh, we need to attach that, I think, to some formal understanding that parking um, entitlement or parking is provided, I'm not sure what the correct verb is here, or verbs, uh, is provided on one or more of the, the deeded uh, 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 parcels that were, according to that deed from 1969, were, quote, to be retained, uh, and they were to be retained for recreation and parking, but it seems that in the course of time that that recreation requirement or, or the aspiration for any recreation to be developed on those parcels has passed and that uh, parking has uh, taken full uh, precedent and not only for the uh, parcels concerned, but for parcels all around uh, for, the, for the whole of the university campus need. And so um, I guess uh, we would want to, I would want to be sure that there was some guaranteed uh, allotment of parking provided. Uh, maybe, yes, it's not on the site, of course, because there's no room on the site. Um, yes, it's on the other sites because historically that's the way this um, zone was created uh, with consolidated parking on separate sites serving those that. Uh, uh, so the ones that we're talking about. And, um, but uh, we, we perhaps understand that if the university uh, decides uh, to, or if it's not controlled otherwise, it'll sell all of the permits uh, because we understand that at the moment there's a dearth of parking uh, campus wide and that it's possible to imagine that uh, students who were late to uh, arrive here uh, might find that even though there's parking entitlements, there's none to, uh, um, I mean, I quite sure how you figure a parking entitlement that is sold out from under somebody. So I think I would want to understand that there were a fixed number of spaces that the university would hold or maybe that becomes a question. Uh, can you reassure us that there are a fixed number or there will be a fixed number of spaces uh, in these uh, parcels that will be allocated uh, and available to 47 Olympia uh, Drive? Um, I think I'll just make that a question for now. I've got a couple of follow-ups around that, but can we, can we, be, can we understand that the waiver is granted uh, because we understand that there is proximate parking um, uh, available, guaranteed available upon purchase of uh, a, a parking uh, permit. Kyle, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I'll try to answer that. Uh, you know, we've purchased a fraternity and sorority in this location. Um, when we purchased the fraternity, it was housing 40 people. Now it houses 230 people. Same thing here. Um, so we're trying to build uh, as much of the much needed housing as we possibly can in the right location, which is adjacent to campus and immediately across the street from UMass managed parking, which has a very unique history here. Uh, the fraternity and the sorority did not have on-site parking. So the entire history of the site is um, the residential portion and the parking and recreation portions are separate. Um, we share those rights with the university, which owns one of the buildings, which has had a, you know, used to be admissions, the Zeta, Zeta, Zeta. 
and then it was the Mather building and now it's, um, it, it is what it is. Uh, the university also owns the rest of those parcels um, that are uh, now, uh, you don't even see the road off of the other Olympia Drive here anymore. It's just kind of paved over. So uh, we could ask for a parking, you know, it, within the bylaw, we could ask for a parking waiver anywhere and say that we're not gonna provide any parking. We're just gonna provide much needed housing and we're relying on buses and we're relying on people not, not showing up with, with cars. What we're trying to do here is, uh, is present a parking waiver because this obviously, this, uh, the history of this site is not uh, black and white within the current bylaw in any way, shape or form. So uh, when we got Olympia Place approved back in 2014, uh, the town subsequently went back and rezoned RF to make Olympia Place the example. Uh, Olympia Place, its density, its size, its scale, its occupancy of the site is the model for uh, the future redevelopment of this parcel. With the purchase of 47, we own the only two privately owned parcels that pay real estate taxes. So the building immediately north of us is the model. The building immediately north of us has no parking on site. It recognizes that it's adjacent to managed parking and immediately adjacent to a very active bus loop. So that's what we're looking to continue to do. Um, in terms of a guarantee, um, I don't have a guarantee. We jointly own, uh, we jointly have rights to five parcels that are six to 700 parking spaces uh, combined. Um, the way it's currently managed works very well with the university managing that as a yellow lot and a blue lot up near Mather. Uh, we don't intend to upset that apple cart. We think that we'd like to continue with that. Um, with the delivery of 57 Olympia, we have not seen a parking issue in this area. Uh, we don't expect to see a parking issue with 47. Um, I know that the university has, you know, dealt with parking in a unique way through COVID. I don't know what they're what this year's parking looks like. I don't know if Chris has reached out to him, but um, that would be a question for the university. Um, with university permits, it's first come first serve for anybody, whether you're a student or a faculty or staff. So um, if you have a car, you need to make sure that you, and you want a permit, you can, you could pick a permit immediately across the street from where you live, or you could be down by the football stadium. Um, we just continue to think that this is, you know, the, the last remaining privately owned parcel in the RF zone, uh, our previous project was used as a model to upzone the whole district to effectively allow for the exact project that we're bringing before you to, uh, uh, to move forward. All right, thank you, Kyle. Um, uh, uh, Doug, can I, have, can I have a follow-up to that? Yeah. Um, um, Thanks, Carl. That, that's helping me get a little further to the, the, the understanding. And I, I think we're going to, as a board, be asked, and maybe as a town, to, to uh, um, trust uh, an understanding. And, and uh, your argument that, uh, that because of the unique uh, history of the way this place was created and has evolved, uh, I think I understand that your argument is that a, an understanding that's been working uh, uh, um, based on your pre previous project for some years, uh, uh, that we should trust that um, is mm, carries weight. Um, uh, but my uh, next questions would be uh, because um, I understand that there, there is uh, buses and, and that bus route is very convenient and that most people will probably uh, choose to use that. But uh, from what we've seen uh, of this in, in development, it's going to cater to quite well-off uh, student, uh, uh, the well-off fraction of the student body. And they're certainly going to drive there with vehicles, I think, because it sounds like that they would be the, it looks like they would be the kind of uh, tenants that would be wealthy enough to arrive and depart from Amherst with vehicles, which they're going to want to park. So I, I, I think we shouldn't uh, be confused about the buses uh, so far as at least needing somewhere for people to park. I think it's interesting that this site is so far away from everything else that maybe we can reasonably um, trust to this that because if they can't get 
parking. It's not like there are immediate residential areas that are going to be impacted by this. So uh, this is a very unusual situation. Um, the uh, uh, how many? Um, so I'm looking now at uh, the uh, Olympia, the, your neighbour. How many uh, parking permits? Uh, because I think with your rental agreements, uh, you track uh, um, parking permits. If people have cars, that you 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 ask them to report or you track their parking permits. And if that's the case. Uh, you'd be able to know how many of your uh, uh, 57 Olympia Drive uh, or uh, our um, or Olympia Place have parking permits and, and, and how that's evolved. Uh, uh, so what percentage of your Olympia Place tenants have permits, uh, let's say, this past year? And has that changed uh, percentage-wise from the beginning in any significant degree? Uh, I would I would say a couple of things. One, I wouldn't equate wealth and bus usage. I think that's a bit antiquated. And I think uh, that uh, that picture I sent shows a broad adoption of the bus. Um, I think that 57 Olympia, we have no control if people choose to buy a parking permit and don't tell us and use their home address or 57 Olympia or whatever address they might also use. I've asked uh, UMass, if they could find that, it's a little tricky to get that information. Uh, I have not received that. I understand that may be complex because, again, they might not use 57 Olympia as the address for the parking. Um, again, I, I think it's a, it's a unique situation. And if we were serious about trying to build this type of housing in Amherst, this would be the exact spot to do it. And um, I think that working with the university to work with a system that's currently working, that's not putting impacts on the university, which would be the first to know if there was a problem with the parking since they manage it, is uh, again, one of the reasons that we're seeking to do a waiver and put as much housing as we can on the site and uh, use the existing parking and bus loops as best we can. Uh, Doug, just to be clear, I wasn't equating uh, wealth with uh, bus use. I was equating it with car ownership. Thank you, Bruce. So, uh... I'd like to remind everybody about Chris's suggestion at the beginning of this hearing. Um, let's try to focus on what else we need from Kyle in the next two weeks uh, to have him come back with, a, you know, provide us with all the information we need to. Mr. Marshall, we lost you. You're frozen. If you can hear us. Crap. Oh, there you are. Yeah. I was going to say, should we take a comment from uh, Karen since she's next in the queue here? Thank you, Tom. Janet? Yeah, are... I, I, I was impressed with. Oh, am I on? Yeah. Yep, go ahead. I was impressed with how often that, but the bus uh, does not come from, you know, in the semester break, and there are plenty of students that are there. So um, I would like to see what space you have dedicated to bicycles, if they're covered or not. And have you, have you thought about this? This is a, a dormitory. This is now, you know, 2022, 2023. We're really trying to facilitate getting away from cars for, for all people. And being a European, I'm pushing for making bicycling more safe and um, more use of, of this. So I'd like to see what you have envisioned as a way of commu you know, commuting with a bicycle. If I sure. Uh, so the, the plan, the landscape plan, the plans that we presented to CONCOM include a bike storage along the north side. Um, it is exterior. Um, it's based on our experience at the project just north of here at 57 Olympia. Uh, there's, we've seen there's two types of bike owners, those that bring the bike inside and those that leave it outside. Um, and the amount of bikes that are stored outside is, is not that significant. The number of bikes that people bring into their apartments uh, is is 
also somewhat limited, but the, there's space to do that. And again, what we've really seen in this location is a lot of bus usage. It is so convenient. It takes you to the center of campus. You don't need to lock up your bike. I, I'm not obviously uh, bike commuting is, is wonderful. I think in this very unique location, we're adjacent to campus and there's a bus loop that hits every 10 minutes. It has, uh, uh, it means that if you have an option of the bus or the bike, a lot of people are choosing the bus. All right. But the bus only goes in the semester and there's a month and a half or something of semester break too in the summer. Uh, that's true. Uh, the bus is less frequent when class is not in, sec in session. Um, um, and uh, again, we're trying to model this based on the bicycle usage we've seen at the property immediately north. Okay. Um, Janet. I have a few questions, but my first quick one is how many covered outdoor bike spaces do you have in this project? proposed project? Uh, there would be no covered uh, outdoor. Um, how many uncovered? Uh, let me pull it up. Sorry, I'm trying to, I'm not sharing anymore, am I? You can, you can reshare if you want. Or you could you could answer that later. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the, Chris, I Mr. Hope, the Chris the Chris idea. If we could go back to the oh, are you looking or I was just looking on the civil plans. Go ahead. So if we go back to the the map, the 1971 map, um, if you can put that up. And then I saw a map of the UMass parking lots. And I wonder if you could tell me where the parking lots are on top of that map, because I would love to see that because it seemed to be like a huge parking lot kind of. And so I just wondered, are they, are the current parking lots matching the lots that are available for parking and recreation? Yes, they are. I'll show you. Do you see the 71 map now? Yeah, yeah. so I don't, know, I don't know if you can draw on it like in Andrew's magic right. pen. Let me, let me try see what I got here. So the first space is the football shaped in the middle. And that's the parking lot in front of Mather building. No. So no. That's the one that you drive. If you're going to Olympia Oaks, you drive past. Okay. Then there's the this lot here, which is the one in front of Mather. Okay. There's also this one here, which is the one north of 57 Olympia. Okay. Uh, there's this one here. Effectively. Okay. And there's this, oops, extra line there, but there's this little ear shaped portion too. So, and, and that, lot's, that lot's actually been enlarged, I know. Yeah. So, it, it's outside the limits of that road at the moment. That, yes, that road doesn't, doesn't really exist. That, yeah. um, all of that is parking, all of this is effectively parking and okay. staging. Okay, so that, that was my first question. So, and then, so there's more parking space areas than the actual dedicated lots to parking and recreation under there, the, so, you uh, know. It's, yep, the, the, the three of the lots got built on, there were 12 originally. Um, some of the others have been uh, subsequently allocated for parking. So when you say you have a right, your tenants have a right or residents to park in those spaces, to me, I'm, you know, I'm like, okay, so they can just park their cars there as long as they're in those, you know, lots in the subdivision, they don't need to apply for a UMass permit. Yeah. Right. They have a right to it. So, you know, I, you know, with that in mind, I would be like, okay, how many spaces do we think the people of that building need? You know, if you can guarantee them spaces in there, I'm fine with everything. Um, but going through the UMass system as, as, kind of how it works is what I understand about UMass parking from talking to some to Tracy Zafian, who's the head of the transportation advisory committee in for Amherst, is when you go to U when you apply for a permit, you say, I'd like a permit and I'd like it here. And maybe in five years they will give you that one. <laughs> and so you don't really have any control about where UMass can say that you're parking. 
And so without, I would, so, you know, okay, so I think your people can park in there and they can assert their rights and hope not get towed and get to a mess. But I also think you could talk to UMass saying, you know, my tenants for these buildings need to park here. Let's work this out because we have a right to park. If they apply for a permit, they need to get a permit and needs to be there. And so I think that would make me feel a lot better. Um, you know, I'm not crazy about waiving a parking requirement in the hopes that someone applies a permit and they get a parking permit here and not over by, you know, the stadium. Um, and so, you know, I've talked to a professor who said, yeah, it took me, you know, five years to get next to my building and, you know, where I work. And so, so I would love to see that tied down with some more agreements with UMass that anybody who lives in that building can apply for a permit and get a permit to park in those things, in those lots. So, okay. um, you know, I, otherwise I think you can just assert your rights and, you know, and, I, you know, I just, I don't, I do think that, you know, we know that students have lots of cars. We know that UMass is maxed out for the last two years. I don't know. We know that's going to be true in the future, but I think that, you know, people in that building are going to have cars, undergraduates more likely than anybody from what I can tell. So I'd like to see that tied down. Um, another question I have about cars um, is, you know, um, electric charging stations. Are there any around there? Because I think that's going to be the most people will be charging their cars close to home and are there charging stations in these lots? Kyle, do you any any knowledge about that? Uh, I do not know if there's charging stations on the lots. Um, relative to asserting rights, um, uh, I mean, we're trying to be good neighbors. We're trying to work with a system that obviously already works. If we had a big problem, I'm sure uh, you would have heard about it or found it. Um, and I think that um, uh, we get housing or parking. Those are the two, those are the two options that we have before us now. And we're obviously trying to advocate for as much housing as we can. Yeah, Kyle, do, you, do your tenants in Olympia Oaks, I mean, Olympia Place, know that they have a right to park anywhere in those lots? Have you told them that? Uh, our tenants have, our, as ownerships, we have deeded rights to those lots. Um, maybe, maybe we could just talk through this, Janet. If, if we okay. wanted to just say to our tenants, why don't you just go park? We don't really, even though we're the neighbor of UMass, even though the university is, is someone we wanna work with, why don't you just go over there and make John King's life completely miserable, park wherever you want. And, and, and then John's gonna have to fight, follow us and chase people down and say, are you 57 Olympia? Are you not 57 Olympia? Let's yeah. set up a separate permitting. Let's set, let's set up a separate sticker. Let's set up and do all these different things. Uh, we could do all that, but we've found to be most effective is to allow UMass parking to continue to manage this as they manage a vast majority of it uh, and allow our tenants to uh, buy a permit if they have a car. Okay, so I'm not encouraging you to, you know, do that thing, but it seems to me if you have... But I think you are. That's what you're asking. You'd like me to solidify something and assert my rights and say that I'm going to occupy this many parking spaces for a parcel that has deeded rights for amongst, you know, uh, us and the university. We're trying to do it in a way that is working with the university, is something that already works with the university and uh, I'd like to obviously continue to, to do so. No, I'm not, I'm not, you know, encouraging a path of conflict, but I do, um, I would like to see, to make sure that people in those buildings have places to park. And I know those lots are full already. And so and I think that you should also see if the university is in fact full this year, because I, yeah, I, you've made, I, I, I would know. question whether the, to my knowledge, they're not all full. Chris, did you get some information on that? I thought it's just anecdotal. Oh, because I thought I thought Chris got an email saying that they were maxed. Uh, Chris? Yes, I received an email from Nancy Buffon saying that um, this past year the parking lots were full, were maxed. Okay. She did say that. Yeah. So I, I would like to see a way to make sure that people in that building have parking. And I, I, I don't want to tell you what to do, but I, I have, you know, that's a, a suggested pass to work it out somehow. All right, Janet. 
Um, I, I guess in kind of in response to that, another way to think about this is it looks like Kyle is willing to put a whole lot of money into building this building, trusting that UMass will take care of the parking issue. And Kyle will be the first one to know if, if UMass is not doing a good job of providing parking for his tenants if they need it. Um, I mean, you could say he's, he's building a building that's gonna require people to use the bus because he's not providing any parking. And um, so he's, uh, you know, I think the, the it's in the interests of the town for him to build these beds so that we don't have more students going out into houses that we'd rather have families in. And um, so, you know, I, I, I don't see the problem here at the moment. All right, um, I don't see any other hands at the moment. Um, board members, uh, why don't you take one last thought about whether there's anything you want from Kyle for the next meeting? Hey, Mr. Marshall, you've frozen up on us once more. Does anyone have any last comments? I see uh, Karen. Go ahead. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder, Kyle, if uh, for the next meeting, if you could look at if there's some way to have some uh, covered, maybe even solar covered bicycle stands, if you could somehow envision encouraging that too just because it isn't done right now there aren't good bicycle paths you have to compete with on the road it's not so safe uh, you need a critical mass of to get this really going and i think it would be a great opportunity so i wonder i'd like to know how many bicycle stands there are and if there was some way you could encourage this, if you could look at it, is there a good path? I guarantee if there's a wonderful path that isn't on the road to the university and great stands, you're gonna up the amount of people and you would take care of the times when in between when there isn't so much bus traffic. And uh, that's what I'd like to encourage. I wonder if that's possible. Yeah, Kyle, maybe I, I know that there's um, uh, downtown, you've done some internal or interior bike storage areas. Um, just interested maybe if there's a number you can put out for us next time we meet, terms of how many bikes might be stored inside, outside, and that might be helpful. Okay. I hear both of those. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. I Thanks, seem to Doug. be having trouble tonight. Thanks, Tom, for jumping right in. Chris, it Sorry. looks like you're the next hand I see. I wanted to encourage board members to look at the um, emails that they've received in the last three days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, because there have been there has been new information. Kyle has presented much of it tonight, but um, I encourage you to look at that. We'll try to include it in your packets. Uh, maybe Pam has included it in the packet for tonight, but um, I just didn't want that information to get lost. So please look at those emails. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. All right, Janet, what do you need from uh, Kyle well, for our next meeting? Well, I didn't get the packet, um, but I was um, interested in what the CONCOM was requiring and we looked at that slide really quickly, like where the buffer zone lines were. And then I'm interested, is the CONCOM, do they want to keep people off the area in the back? And then, you know, the covered porch access. I was just trying to think, you know, I think that um, Andrew had thought that would be a nice place for people to go outside and maybe do some sitting or hanging out. And you went really quickly through that slide. It might be in our packet. It might be late breaking news. I just wanted to just get a little because that slide went by really fast and I'm speaking a little bit from I don't have a full set of whatever's yeah I think that one 
So where are the buffer zones on that? I can't quite see that. So the red line is the 100 foot buffer. Okay. And, and then, then you have a 50 foot buffer that is the one that just touches the edge of the property right there. Okay, and then did the CONCOM want people not to be in the 100 foot or the 50 foot buffer zone? Uh, no, it wasn't about people. It was really about work. So trying to make sure that any stormwater was outside of the 50 foot, uh, trying to make sure that any plantings within the 100 foot were all native, uh, trying to make sure that the work for stormwater retainage, which these are the retainage structures that are below grade, uh, were managed properly and were planted over properly. It wasn't a discussion about uh, access or I mean, there's so, a trail that runs through the center of the wetland. You know, there's a there's a yellow trail that, that the town you park at right north of here and you walk down. Yeah, so I think Andrew had been interested in access to that trail from the back and maybe using that back as a seating area. So I wondered if that was possible. And then there's a I cover. That, Janet, real quick, the grading oh. back here makes that a little uh, difficult to make it accessible. And uh, and more so when we're working with stormwater and working with uh, concom requirements. And the covered porch is only accessible from inside the building. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. How big is that? Uh, that's this lighter gray portion here, which is just a rough, a uh, couple hundred square feet. Okay. Thank you. All right, Bruce. Um, oh, I am already unmuted. Oh, I, one of the things we received was a, 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 a traffic study um, and very elaborate. And uh, I, I had to say that, uh, uh, and this may be a question for staff, I think, I, I wasn't so concerned about traffic here because I thought that this was basically a place where hundreds of cars got parked and were coming and going. And uh, and what's what might change here that some of those cars might be used by people in this building, um, uh, but most of them won't be. And the number of cars would seem to be, that comes in and out of this site would seem to be largely generated by the size of the existing parking. And so uh, the question for staff is, would this building really have any effect on traffic? Uh, it, the, as I understood it, the traffic study didn't seem to think it was going to be a big deal, but uh, it seemed to me that this is one of the few times when you might imagine that uh, a building would have almost no impact on the traffic. Uh, am I, uh, is, is my comments, is, uh, what, what, what I might consider common sense, a flawed here, or uh, is it broadly correct? Chris? I think that's what essentially what the traffic study said that there wouldn't be much impact on the traffic on East Pleasant Street, but um, you also have to, you know, factor in whether that parking lot is full or not, and it was full last year, mm -hmm. so um, I think your surmise about you know there not being a lot of um, change in the amount of traffic if the parking lot is full is right. But if the parking lot isn't full and this building is added, then there would be a change. So um, I think you should read the parking study carefully. There's just three pages that are really full of information. The rest of it is all parking counts and you know peak yeah. hours and that kind of thing. But if you read those three pages, you'll really see that there is not a significant impact um, based on this building to okay. um, traffic at that intersection. And Doug, if I may, I also noticed, uh, and I can't remember where I saw it because these things were flying around, but uh, whether it was in Kyle's management plan or whether it was in your development report about uh, low flow plumbing fixtures uh, and to the extent that we have any control over that, which I don't know that we do, but if we do or encourage, uh, if we're going to mention low flow plumbing fixtures, if anyone's going to mention low flow plumbing fixtures, I would encourage that there be... Uh, um, it's be associated with numbers that say, well, are those flows? Because low flow is really a meaningless term to me because it, it's just, you can say it's just lower than whatever you want to compare it to when there's no standard. So can we substitute any reference to low flow fixtures with uh, numbers, which uh, uh, for gallons per minute for showers and gallons per flush for toilets and things like that? There's only four or five, so maybe not even that, three or four, fixtures for which those numbers would be relevant. And I think we, instead of using a 
a wave, arm waving term like low flow, we should uh, in parenthesis uh, put the uh, proposed um, flow rates for each of the fixtures involved. Kyle, do you think that was in some of the material you provided and how would your fixtures differ from the flows that are required by the plumbing code? Well, I think we're fortunate that the plumbing code in particular, the stretch code um, is forcing all these buildings to get better and better. And as of January, the HERS rating on, on new buildings has to be 45, which is less than the 55 and less than the 65 when the stretch code was implemented. So I think that code and low and and uh, efficiency are working hand in hand together. Um, obviously, when we go and seek lead certification for these buildings, achieving lead gold is based on uh, having fixtures that have actual flow rates to them for each of the faucets and toilets and shower heads and so on. So we, we have to do that within energy star ratings within lead. Um, and, uh, and obviously, uh, in order to meet stretch code. Uh, but your your intent was not to do fixtures that were any uh, better or you know used less water than the plumbing code. Your your intent was to meet the stretch code and the lead requirements, yeah, and, I, I, and that I, was it. I was basically uh, interested in whether you were applying Californian uh, standards or whether you were applying Massachusetts standards. Uh, we haven't. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the California standards. Uh, I think that the uh, low flow in our minds is, is the uh, fixtures that we've installed in all the projects to, yeah. you know. Uh, so I, I guess I would just say they're, they're therefore code compliant low flow, but if you leave the code compliant off, my understanding would be that you're doing better than code and therefore you're probably stretching for the Californian standards. So it's just a matter of communication. So code compliant low flow sounds like what, what is intended here. Okay. Yeah. That, a better way to say it. Okay, good. Thanks, Bruce. Karen. Okay, Karen's uh, Sorry. Was, was a legacy, okay? <laughs> and I've just turned off my camera to see if this will stop getting my Zoom interruptions. So, um, Bruce, your hand is still up. Uh, is Hello. that a legacy? It is. My and hand you, is up and my mute is off. That's right. So let's, let's okay, good. Uh, any other board uh, comments? Um, let's look and see if there are any hands. Okay, Pam Rooney from the public. Please bring Pam over and let's get her name and her address. All right, Hi, Pam. Pam. Hi, thank you. Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Uh, would appreciate actually if the packet could include the updated floor plans and and package that um, Mr. Wilson has provided. Um, I've only seen earlier versions of it, so having having current versions would be good. Uh, a question for Mr. Wilson: uh, in the in the era of private public partnerships. I'm wondering if Archipelago is interested or could be asked to provide some benefits in the form of improving bike lanes on the stretch of Olympia Drive from, from his buildings uh, out to East Pleasant Street to facilitate, in fact, the use of bicycles. And if, if Archipelago could also be asked or required to provide a, a couple of uh, electric vehicle charging stations all in the name of, because he's not having to provide any public, any parking spaces for his tenants. Um, and he's relying entirely on PVTA circulation that there's maybe some quid pro quo that would be appropriate uh, to help facilitate the transfer of students from his building to campus. And I think it's totally appropriate for that kind of contribution to uh, the greater good. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, Chris. I um, just wanted to respond to one of Pam's comments. Um, as soon as we get a document in emailed to us, 
I uh, forwarded to the planning board members and I forwarded to Pam and to um, Nate. And then I asked Pam to post it in the packet. And so almost instantaneously, Pam posts things. So if you wanna look at the packet for tonight's meeting, you will see the most updated information that um, has been made available by the applicant. Thanks. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, if there aren't any more Oh, uh, I do see Jennifer Taub's hand. Why don't we bring her over? Jennifer, Hello, Jennifer. if you give us your name and your address. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm Jennifer Taub at 259 Lincoln Avenue. And I just had a small comment, which was um, regarding students and bringing cars to school, that, you know, that why they would need parking, even if the Libya place is you know, relatively close to campus and there's bus access that um, many students bring cars to school because that's how they get from their hometowns to school and not even that they may not even be using the cars on a daily basis, but they do need a place to park them. So, um, you know, that's why we caution that even with, you know, transportation available that students will still need a place to park um, and, you know, Again, for students not parking every day, they may not need them to be as close to Olympia Place as if they're driving to school. Although I, I would, um, you know, I would uh, echo what Janet McGowan said in that I, I think it's important to determine where those parking spaces would be that the university would provide. But um, it's just it's been my experience in my neighborhood, and then you know just generally what I've observed that even. Um, you know, again, if they're using uh, the PV, the Pioneer Valley transportation, or even walking to school, that that doesn't mean that they're not bringing cars to campus, you know, when, with them when they when they come at the beginning of the semester. All right. That's my only comment. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, maybe uh, that's that's the last hand I've seen from the board and the public. So maybe we can have a motion to continue this hearing. Uh, Chris, should we move it? Should we have it continued on the 16th? And um, maybe what do you want to do? What time? The 16th would be good. And um, you could continue it to seven o'clock, although you're probably you know, going to take it later than that. But just in case something happens with food and drink establishments, and it makes it vanish okay. for the night. It would be good to have Kyle back at um, seven. All right, uh, Tom, is that so moved? All right, thank you, Andrew. Seconded. All right. Uh, any more discussion for tonight? Not seeing any hands. All right, let's uh, continue to talk about. Vote to continue. Yes, vote is we will continue to November 16th at seven o'clock. Bruce. Yes. Tom. I, I also want to thank Kyle for his responses to all of our questions and probing about all of these different issues and coming back with answers. And I think it's fantastic. So thank you. So aye. Aye. Okay. Andrew. Aye. Janet. Aye. Uh, Karen. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Six votes in favor. The motion passes. Kyle, we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you for everybody's time. Appreciate it. All right. Okay. Good night. Good night. <clears throat> okay. So we'll now move on to item six on our agenda. The time now is 9.52. Uh, Chris, do we have any old business topics not anticipated 48 hours in advance? No old business that I know of. Thank you. All right. Janet, you are so, muted. Oh, I'm back. So I wanted to ask um, the questions that um, Elizabeth Veerling asked about the um, downtown or Amherst Center design guidelines. And then... Um, the banks parking lot engineering analysis, and then is the planning department looking at other parking lots? Because I was kind of wondering that too. I didn't know about the grant, that sounds good. 
So maybe Nate can answer that. He's most um, familiar with those questions. Sure. <clears throat> the um, yeah, the downtown design standard guidelines is something that staff had discussed. Um, changing a little bit now with the the grant, we may um, add that in. <clears throat> we haven't confirmed the timeline if the you know if the how if the planning grant can coincide with when we want to, to have the project move forward, but it, it may be that, um, you know, we could augment our budget and services um, with this planning grant to do, you know, what we had in the downtown RFP was some mention of streetscape standards. And what we applied for was a, a more in-depth look at it, um, you know, with the roadways, uh, bike lanes, you know, width of sidewalks, amenities, types of site furnishings. And so it goes hand in hand. Um, so we just have to determine how that could be incorporated uh, or not. Um, so did the RFP go out? I guess that's my- No, no, no. no we, um, after the last planning board meeting, there were a few really good points raised about, you know, how many meetings could be um, over Zoom or in person and how could we uh, kind of describe the scope? Was it, you know, looking at three different types of building typology, you know, urban center, um you know maybe uh transitional and then residential and so <clears throat> we staff has met a few times and we've been refining the language but um you know when we heard probably like two weeks ago that we might be getting this planning grant we just waited to see if we could um you know what that would mean so and, then, right. and what about the garage the garage we we were getting under contract with uh desmond design management they're um they're an engineering uh firm that uh is often used with municipalities when they do garages they're based out of boston they actually worked on the original garage as the design consultant they helped greenfield do their their garage uh, they're kind of you know one of the leading firms and so we've contracted with them to provide a technical assessment of the existing boltwood garage okay. uh, a visual inspection and then also um a review of the um uh, existing they have the drawings and so the kind of do load calculations and code compliance to determine if additional levels could be added and so preliminarily they think they, they could be they have to examine it more uh, i mean honestly the 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 exterior load bearing points of the garage are so close to the adjacent buildings now you know i think their study will then help us ask the question you know, would we really want to do this? Um, you know, the you know, so they're gonna look at like you know this traffic circulation ramps, uh, height of deck, you know, proximity to building, uh, and they're gonna say if it's feasible or not. And then I think really it becomes a question for the town. You know, would we would we actually move forward with something like that? Um, you know, we haven't looked at studying other sites. I think that would be after this study. All right. Thanks, Nate. Chris, do you have a follow up yeah i just wanted to note that they're going to give us some concept <laughs> sketches and they're also going to um try to give us ballpark uh cost estimates um particularly with regard to um cost of a space for instance um if you build a space on a you know virgin site that hasn't been built on before that's one cost but if you try to retrofit an existing parking lot, that's another cost. So they're gonna help us out with that as well. And um, there was one other question that Pam Rooney asked and that had to do with whether we're looking at other um, potential parking lot sites, parking garage sites. And we have not had time to do that, but um, we do intend to, um, the staff intends to make a, um, what should I say? not not a very technical pass at that but a kind of conceptual pass at that but that has not occurred yet all right Thank thanks you. chris and janet i think that takes care of your questions okay um all right so that's it for old business and now we'll go to topic seven the time is 9 58 uh new business and karen you had a topic you wanted to introduce to us um so we'll have a why don't you introduce it and then we can have a, a short period for comments tonight 
Yeah, thank you for taking this up. Um, I thought Pam Rooney made such a, a good pitch to Kyle uh, saying, you know, could we have a quid pro quo, uh, a contribution that you somehow work together with the university to uh, facilitate a good bicycle path to East Pleasant and then maybe through some of their land to the campus. I don't know what role the planning board can take to somehow um, I, I facilitate the fact that we really have to move to a completely different way of, of moving around, especially students who are prime people for, for getting into uh, alternative ways of transportation. <clears throat> if we had bicycle paths, as I know in, in um, Europe and in, in Berlin, where I'm kind of my second home, the bicycle paths are not on the street very often. They share the sidewalk. They're a different color brick. And as a pedestrian, I know my husband always pushes me out of the way and says, you're in the bicycle path and you have to sort of get used to that. But it really makes bicycle riders feel much, much safer than if they have to share the road. So that's something to look at. And what role does the planning board have? How can we um, move this along because I think it's a really important step that's coming. I see all the, the paths that are sort of delegated as bicycle paths downtown. I think it's great. I think the university does realize it has to move in this, this direction, but developers, especially um, this Olympia Drive, that's, that's something that's happening right now and it's in the prime location. So can we make demands? I'm not quite sure. I'm, I'm such a new member, what we can do. And I'd love to hear what other people think about this. Thanks. All right. Does anybody want to respond, Chris? Um, I just wanted to recommend that you talk about this in a very generic mm -hmm. way, um, because um, Kyle is not here right now. And so if you wanted to talk about this in relation to his project on Olympia Drive, you would really need to talk about it with him because it's, um, you know, it relates to that public hearing. So just talk about this in a generic manner for now. And then when the hearing is open on November 16th, you can bring this up in a specific way related to that project. Yeah, thanks, you're right. Uh, Bruce. Um, two comments. Uh, I'm broadly interested too in this and, and the other sorts of things that uh, we might encourage, such as, for example, solving the problem of uh, providing uh, charging stations for apartments. Uh, I have thoughts on that. I'm not going to say them now, but it's the same sort of thing. But in the case of uh, bicycles and, and, and pathways and so forth, I, I, I imagine we don't really have leverage, except uh, that we might uh, if we think... Uh, about it from the point of view of parking waivers and so forth. We're not obligated to grant parking waivers, and but I know we've been doing that creatively in many ways for many, many years for all sorts of reasons. And, uh, and, and we could imagine that in the future we might, on certain projects uh, where it's appropriate, we could uh, uh, tie a parking waiver uh, to um, some kind of a gesture in this direction, maybe putting a roof on a parking uh, on a bicycle station, maybe extending it, uh, maybe making uh, these uh, in bicycle storage more secure uh, and and uh, and um, and sheltered. Um, we might also seek to uh, uh, think of accommodate accommodations for probably what will be increasingly uh, you know, small electric propulsions for bicycles, which are gonna make those bicycles heavier. And that's gonna change some things about them, uh, which they're not gonna be able to bring them up into their rooms, perhaps probably because they're heavy, but they're gonna be valuable. So we're gonna be, people are gonna be interested in different ways of securing them. So I think we should be uh, mindful of all of that. And, and that's probably part of what, uh, um, Karen's thinking ahead too as well. Uh, so uh, I think um, I think this is something that uh, we can think of uh, in respect of uh, uh, project uh, applications that come before us. 
All right, thanks, Bruce. Um, I guess I, the, when I heard this uh, about this topic, the things that came to mind were that Karen or somebody might take the town plan and figure out where you would want to put bike paths, um, and then that would that would essentially prompt a conversation about how 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 might the town get the rights to have a public bike path through what is now private property and um, you know would that be eminent domain would it be uh, a tax on real estate sales or how would you do that um, but you know I think you I would start by thinking about where is the where are the lines of demand for a uh, more convenient bicycle connection that isn't already served on a road or isn't already provided. Um, and I, I, I will second Bruce's comment about electric bicycles. We just spent a couple of weeks in Europe and uh, saw a lot of parking spaces reserved for bicycles. Um, so, you know, um, if the town really wanted to encourage bicycles i think there's some acts that the town could take to say this is what we want to do and then uh, then we might be in a position to say to a developer look your property's right next to a a, a a location that we want to do a bike path now's our chance to persuade you to help us build it so uh, but until we have a vision i don't know i don't think it's going to be easy to be telling people what to do. Uh, Janet. Um, Karen, I would encourage you to talk to Tracy Zapian, who's the um, chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee. I think following up on Doug's suggestion, I think they already have figured out where they want more bicycle use um, and better pedestrian um, movement. So that might be, she's like a, she has tons of information. I also think we really do need covered and secured bike Things, and I think we could require that of developers because especially electric bikes, I have a friend who has one, she uses it as it's her only transportation and it is too heavy for her to carry upstairs. And she's very worried about it. She lives in San Francisco of having it stolen because it's worth thousands of dollars. And so I think that's a great issue. Um, and then in terms of where to put the, how to get the access rights, like I have a 30 foot public right away. So you know, the town of Amherst could always put a bike lane, you know, on my front lawn, basically. And um, I think at this point in our climate crisis, I would invite that, you know, just to, to move things a little better. So I think there's a lot of public rights away on the main roads that are much wider than the road that you're or sidewalk you're looking at. All right. Um, Chris. I, I just wanted to mention that there is a pedestrian and bicycle um, plan that was done um, in coordination with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission a number of years ago. There's a text that was written and there are maps that are in a kind of incomplete state. The text is finished, but the maps are, um, That's great. as I said, incomplete. The TAC, the Transportation Advisory Committee has an intention to work with DPW to finish the maps, but um, Karen and others may want to take a look at that. And if you email me, I can send you a link. I'm not sure I could tell you today exactly where to go to find that document. Unless right, Lee has it up already. Thank you, Chris. Um, Bruce, go ahead. I think I'd like to try to close this conversation soon. So it's getting late. A question, I think a quick one, but if not, it can be answered later of staff, I think. Um, apropos of a potential funding source for some of the things that uh, you, Doug, were mentioning um, about bicycle lanes and so forth or creating them. Um, I thought, well, uh, the CPA fund sounds like a, a fund, but uh, I'm, the question is, is the CPA fund uh, restricted by Massachusetts statute to the uh, four uh, portals that currently is or could uh, bicycle uh, transportation be uh, imagined to be uh, 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 something that could be supported through the CPA. Chris? 
I think if you could characterize it as recreation, it could be supported because that is one of the things that's supported by CPA. Um, I don't know if transportation would be considered, but we're always looking for um, grants. And um, one of the grants that we just got was for um, work on Belchertown Road, and we're hoping to incorporate some bicycle, um, what should I say, infrastructure into Belchertown Road. And it's always sort of in our minds when we're thinking about working with Department of Public Works on roadways. So. Just wanted and, to offer and bicycle lanes could be part of the streetscape design standards too, yep. whenever that happens. Okay, so why don't we, I, at least momentarily, there aren't any other hands. So let's, let's close this item and, um, you know, move on. Um, time is 10.09. And um, Chris, is there any other new business for tonight? Just one thing I wanted to let you know, and I could do this in report of the chair, but I'll just tell you now. Uh, we are um, very sad to be losing Ben, who has been with us for two and a half years. He's going to work with the uh, Massachusetts um, Department of Transportation, and he's been you know, terrific to work with. He's really innovative, and he's got all kinds of skills, and we're really going to miss him, but we wish him good luck in his new um position. But in the meantime, <laughs> we're going to have a lot of work to do to fill um, Ben's role until we hire somebody to replace him. So um, Nate and I are going to be working overtime to try to fill Ben's role. Mostly right. Nate, but Sorry to hear we try to not, <laughs> not burden Nate too much. Oh, boy. Anyway, it's, yeah, I know. Very sad. Yeah. Okay. Um... Number number eight, form A A and R subdivision applications. Pam? No, not tonight. All right. ZBA applications? Nope. I haven't All heard right. of anything. SP, S, SPP, SPR, SUB? Yes. There is one for um I'm trying to think of what it's for. Is it Belchertown Road? It's service no, it's not Belchertown Road. But we have a couple of them. They haven't been uh, formally um, brought into the system yet. So we'll let you know about them next time around. All right. All right. Great. All right. Um, number number 11, the committee and liaison reports. Bruce, anything on PVPC? Well, I'm still not formally appointed. Um, but uh, I have been relying on uh, as uh, on Jack and his uh, reports of uh, activities of the uh, commission have been forwarded to us all, I think. So basically, I, uh, my report would be what you've received from Jack. Okay. Chris, is there any way to expedite getting Bruce appointed? I did email the town manager. Um, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, and I copied Bruce, I believe. Um, and the town manager has been embroiled in other topics recently, but I will um, email him again. How's that? All right. Um, Andrew, PV or uh, CP, CPAC? Yeah, thanks, Doug. Um, first, I'd say thanks, Chris, for sending out. Um, the uh, list of projects and uh, would encourage folks to please send over any questions they have. I did get some already that I was able to forward on to the applicants and and you can share them with me up until the last minute and I'll, I'll bring that forward. Um, I don't know that I'd mentioned before. Um, we have right now we have about $1.8 million um, that that number could go up. Um, we have a budget budgeted reserve, which we could tap into as well, but let's just call it 1.8 for right now. Um, we have 6.4 million more than that in projects, right? There's, there's over $8 million of projects that are being proposed. So um, we definitely won't be able to do all of that. Um, again, any questions you have that you would like me to forward on, please do. The presentations start next Thursday and they will be held, I believe, over the next three weeks. Andrew, are there any particular projects that are being proposed that you think have close uh, 
sort of impact or some things that we would be particularly interested in from the planning board? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I don't know that, the ne that there necessarily is. I think the community housing, um, that's, you know, there's a lot of money that's being allocated towards that. It's, it's something that we've talked about a fair amount um, over the years in this. Um, so that could be an area. You could take a look at some of the community housing projects that we have. Um, aside from that, there is some, uh, an open space uh, proposal, which we haven't had one for a while. Um, and yeah, other than that, I would say, you know, take a look at the projects, which, which have, which are of, uh, interest to you personally, as well as in your capacity as a planning board member. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Tom DRB. Sure. I, I mean, I will follow up to say that I don't think there's anything of significant impact, um, that we, <laughs> that we've been reviewing. Um, I mean, a lot of it's just been signage and wayfinding within town. So there's, um, you know, it's cool that we get to see like new businesses and kind of where they're going and when they're opening way before everybody else does. But, you know, there's a juice cafe that we approve some signage for. Um, there's a Chinese or Asian restaurant um, at 63 Main. So that's right downtown. They have some new signage and screens in their windows. The spoke has some new signage that we've approved. Um, the, you know, is pretty minimal, pretty clean. And then the Drake has had several kind of iterations of signage that we've been reviewing and approving. So it's been a lot of like, you know, really small, um, but I was to say maybe somewhat important revisions to the uh, urban landscape. Um, from an aesthetic perspective. Um, that's really it. All right, thank you. Janet, Solar Bylaw. Um, at our last meeting, we met um, briefly, the GZA associates were doing a solar assessment, which is sort of a technical look at where solar could work in Amherst, um, like rooftops and parking lots, and then there'd be limitations um, not just physical limitations, but it might be legal limitations like on certain types of land. And then also they'll be doing um, kind of a community outreach um, to figure out like what the value community values of Amherst are. I don't have that much information on that yet. And then um, one of our members who is, um, she was giving us a talk about solar siting, like all the steps involved in siting a large scale array which takes at least two years. And it seems almost a miracle that anything ever gets built between all the permitting. And then even if you get all your permits, you might not be, you might not be able to like be able to send your power to the grid. So it was, it was brutal, but interesting. And then we're going to look at the economics of arrays and stuff like that. So it's totally interesting. Great. All right. Uh, Chris, CRC or Nate. Yeah, um, so well, the CRC uh, has been looking at the um, flood mapping and they recommended um, all four aspects of flood mapping, the firm maps, the flood insurance study, and the two things that you looked at tonight. So they've made positive recommendations on those. That was last week or two weeks ago. And then, or maybe it was last week. Then this week, they're um, looking at food and drink establishments tomorrow night, tomorrow evening at 4.30. Um, so they're taking that up. And then in their spare time, they're working on rental registration. And that's kind of a big, big deal that they're working on with Rob Mora and his staff. So those are the things that they're doing. All right. Thank you. Report of chair. I have no report tonight, given the hour. Uh, Chris, any report of staff? I don't think I have any further reports. OK. All right, the time is 1017. I guess we can adjourn. We got to figure out how to do this faster. This this is just brutal. I think we have too many agenda items. That's my feeling like two big ones would be good, not three. Yeah. Doug, you've done a great job of trying to manage yes. all of it. I appreciate well, I, it. I hate to push you guys to be faster, but it I, you know, I know how long it takes to repeat something verbally before.